Recycling Culture. Annual workshop this year. The theme this year for the annual workshop for Kirk is Community Connections. And we have a wonderful group of speakers and presentations today. And as always, thank you for joining and supporting Kirk. I am Eric Halverson, um, Kirk's program coordinator. I'll be one of a few folks helping running the show behind the scenes. Um, but so before we get started, we have a few housekeeping notes. If you have problems with your audio or video during the webinar, we recommend you visit support.zoom.us to troubleshoot any technical issues. Um, to avoid background noise, please keep your lines on mute during other people's presentations. We encourage you to submit questions using the chat section of the Zoom dashboard in front of you. We will read as many of these as possible out loud to our speakers at the end of each presentation. And if you would like to unmute yourself to ask questions, please wait until the designated question and answer time to respect our speakers' presentations. Copies of today's presentation will be available to download and a recording available to stream for those who purchased registration to the program and for anyone who registered today. Um, so stay tuned for a follow-up info a follow up email for this information and that will be sent out um, shortly after. Um, so this will be recorded so you know we want to have everyone participating in the conversation um, but we'll, we'll, we will be recording this for those who couldn't make it to this live but still want to participate and join. So um, let me introduce to you the chair of Kirk's board of directors, Jen Maxwell. Thank you so much, Eric. Welcome everyone. Um, as Eric said, my name is Jennifer Maxwell. I am your current Kirk chair and I am the sustainability program director for Appalachian State University in North Carolina. Um, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. We have friends from US through Canada here with us today. Um, really grateful for everybody's engagement. Um, I know we continue with quite challenging times right now. And so um, just really grateful that our Kirk membership is still able to engage and be a part of this, even though we have to do things virtually and a little bit different than um, historically when we've been able to be together in person. Um, since we're discussing community connections today, I found it only fitting to just acknowledge this community and what a wonderful community Kirk has been. I've been a part of Kirk since um, early 2000s and um, I can't say enough about just the lifelong friendships and kind of mentorships and, and best practice sharing and technical knowledge that I've learned over time with this group. And um, it's just been a wealth of knowledge for my throughout my career. And so if you're new to Kirk and um, not too familiar with us. We have over 900 members. Um, we are across, like I said, United States and Canada, as well as um, we're led by a 12 member volunteer board. Um, and we have a program coordinator, Erica, you met earlier. So um, just wanted to give a quick thanks to um, our board members and our fabulous marketing and programs team for putting this um, agenda together today. Um, could you? Bump up a couple of slides for me, Eric. Thank you. So um, lots of ways to connect with Kirk. If you're not familiar, we have our website. We have a LinkedIn group, Facebook, Twitter. Um, and then our Recycle Listserv, a lot of people are familiar with, but we have transitioned recently to a Google group. And so if you haven't made that tra transition yet, um, I think Eric is going to put in the chat the this um, email that you can, I mean, web address that you can reach to sign up for the listserv in the Google group. It just gives us a lot more capability. So same um, functionality as our listserv before through Brown, but just um, better ways for us to be able to continue our connections. Um, next slide. So we love for our members to get involved too. So maybe you're not um, quite prepared to jump in and become a, a board member, but you have some interest in being part of our committee. So I kind of wanted to share those. Today, our newest committee is our Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, our JEDI committee. Um, so we are really working toward a more diverse and inclusive organization, both um, in our membership and programming, as well as our, our board um, makeup. And so, if you have some interest in passion there, if um, you would like to get involved, please reach out to us and let us know. 
On finance and sponsorships, um, really that committee is working really creatively to develop funding opportunities and look for sponsorships um, across the nation and then to Canada. And so if you have some interest or passion there or you um, have some experience and you'd like to be a part of that, we would welcome that. Um, board development's focus is on the success of our board of directors. And so we um, certainly value all the work that board development's doing from recruiting new members to our, our board retreats and, and really just um, heavily involved in our board development. And then our marketing and programs is looking at our programming and um, getting involved with our programming and marketing efforts. And so if you have a passion about that, or even if you have suggestions and things that you want to share with us, we would welcome that. Um, we have our webinar series, our newsletter content, things like that, that we're always looking at. So I um, would love for you to be involved if you're interested. Um, next slide. So a few upcoming events I wanted to mention. Um, I mentioned our webinar series. So we have two more webinars in October. We have Integrating Reduction and Reuse in Messaging, which is October 21st at 2 p.m. Eastern. And then in December, our webinar is Diversion Upstream, Working with Purchasing to Prevent Waste, which is December 16th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, and we'll also be on the lookout. We will be having a members meeting like we had last year. It will be first of the year. But it's an opportunity for us to look at our year in review and then um, come together just to celebrate all of our successes and continue our, that sense of community within Kirk. So we always have a good time with our members meeting. So be on the lookout for information about that first of the year. All right, next slide. Okay, well, I have the pleasure of welcoming Alexis Goldsmith, the National Organizing Director from Beyond Plastics as our keynote today, Alexis. We're so excited to have you here. Um, Alexis is a grassroots organizer who grew up in Indiana and is an alumni of Indiana University Bloomington. Before joining Beyond Plastics, she worked in hunger relief with the food pantries for the Capital District and also served as the executive producer for the Hudson Mohawk Magazine, a grassroots radio news hour based out of the Sanctuary for Independent Media in Troy, New York. She's worked closely with frontline communities facing waste incineration in New York's capital region. While at the sanctuary, she co-founded the Hudson Mohawk Environmental Action Network, a grassroots consortium promoting environmental justice and indigenous rights along the Hudson River. She currently keeps pastured pigs, rabbits, and a garden upstate. Welcome, Alexis. We're excited to hear from you. Hi, thank you for that um, wonderful introduction. And I'm so uh, excited to be here today and, and meet everybody. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, so um, as you just heard, I'm the National Organizing Director with Beyond Plastics. We are a national uh, nonprofit based out of Bennington College in Bennington, Vermont. And my role is to build the grassroots movement around this issue, basically. And that means coming to talks like this, but I also work directly with um, volunteers across the country who are doing grassroots lobbying efforts and trying to amplify this, uh, this issue. Before I was, um, before I came on to Beyond Plastics, I was with the Sanctuary for Independent Media and I did uh, independent journalism there. So uh, in New York's capital region, I did a lot of journalism on uh, environmental justice issues and uh, race, racial justice issues. This is our uh, information. Uh, pl please follow us on social media. I hope uh, that people will reach out after this presentation. Um, and I gave some information also to Leanna to share with you all after the presentation if you wanna get more involved. Um, you can reach out to me at any time. I'm happy to share my email and my phone number um, and happy to collaborate basically. So um, with that being said, I really appreciate your time and attention on this. Um, this is going to be a very intense presentation. We're gonna go on a wild ride through the life cycle of plastics um, and it can be very emotionally intense as well. So I'm just gonna, let's all take a deep breath. All right, so 99% of plastics are manufactured from fossil fuels. The majority of plastics manufactured in the US come from 
a gas called ethane, which is a cheap byproduct of hydraulic uh, fracturing. Um, hydraulic fracturing is a method of extracting shale gas from deep underground deposits. The process has a high risk of contaminating drinking water. Most plastics are now manufactured from ethane gas, as I said, which is shown uh, as a flare right here. Uh, fracking has boomed in the United States uh, in the past 20 or so years, uh, which has resulted in a gas glut, meaning there is more gas than domestic markets can absorb. Um, climate change and coronavirus have also impacted the gas market. So plastics manufacturing from ethane provides a new revenue source for oil and gas companies. To frack a well, the gas company uses millions of gallons of water mixed with chemicals and sand that are pumped deep underground, fracturing the bedrock so the pockets of gas can be extracted. This slurry of water, chemicals, and sand and gas come back out of the well along with radon and naturally occurring radioactive isotopes from deep underground. It is from this slurry that the ethane to produce plastics is separated along with uh, waste products. This is a still from the movie Gasland, which believe it or not was released in 2010. In that time, we better understand the impacts of fracking, but not much has changed from a regulatory standpoint. There are more than 1.7 million fracking wells now in the US compared to 26,000 in 2000. Many of them are abandoned. Many groups are vocal that fracking should be banned entirely because of its health and water impacts. The damages or the health damages of fracking are estimated to be between 13 and $29 billion every year. I mentioned that uh, the fracking wells bring up naturally occurring radioactive isotopes. That radioactivity accumulates in the wastewater and in the oil and gas equipment. This is a screenshot of a groundbreaking article published in Rolling Stone in 2019. Uh, that details how scandalously unregulated radioactive fracking waste is. The author Justin Noble is currently working on a book on this topic and um, he's really awesome. He does webinars if you ever wanna do a webinar on this topic. He lives uh, not too far from me actually in upstate New York. Um, this is a screenshot of text from that Rolling Stone article, uh, and what happens to the fracking waste is anyone's guess. Much of it winds up in injection wells, which I'll get to in a moment. A report from Food and Water Watch has documented the fracking waste being used to irrigate agricultural crops in states with drought issues. Two proposed state bills in Ohio would allow for the commodification of fracking wastewater for purposes like road de-icing. And this photo is an unlined fracking waste pit. It doesn't have a liner, it just has a net over it to uh, keep the birds out. So once the ethane is separated from the fracked gas slurry, it is transported by pipeline. This is a photo of the Mariner East 2 pipeline that goes across Pennsylvania all the way to the East Coast to send ethane from the Marcellus and Utica shale basins overseas to be made into plastics. The sheer length of pipelines in the US continues to grow, contributing to the ongoing expansion of fossil fuel infrastructure. The good news is we have seen some divestments from major pipelines like the infamous Keystone XL pipeline, but Enbridge's Line 3 and Line 5 pipelines and the Mountain Valley Pipeline in Appalachia are facing ongoing opposition, though they receive very little media attention compared to other issues in the US today. Uh, this is Winona LeDuc. She is an Anishinaabekwe indigenous leader. Um, and like many indigenous peoples, largely unseen by corporate news media, she has dedicated her life to advocating for in indigenous control of their homelands, natural resources, and cultural practices. The Enbridge Line 3 pipeline, if completed, will run through major water bodies in Anishinaabwe territory in Minnesota. 
Leduc was arrested uh, this past summer along with more than 600 others defending Anishinaabwe land from line three. And I'm just curious how many people on this call uh, already knew that more, more than 600 people have been arrested over this issue. Um, I'm curious because I, I do feel that this issue is not getting media attention and you can feel free to raise uh, your hand if you knew that. Um, Line 3 is owned by Enbridge, which is a Canadian company. Um, in a Democracy Now! interview after her arrest, LeDuc told host Amy Goodman that Enbridge was paying the Minnesota police who arrested her to protect their pipeline from protesters. She also said that the Minnesota police wanted the contract with Enbridge to pay for weapons upgrades. So the ethane that has been separated from that uh, fracking process goes uh, into the plastic supply chain. It may need to be stored before it goes to a plastics factory and gas uh, liquids and fracking wastewater are frequently stored in injection wells. Uh, these are underground caverns that have been carved from deep salt formations. They're usually not natural. There are approximately 180,000 class two oil and gas injection wells in the US. That's enough that if they were lined up from New York City to LA, there would be an injection well every 82 feet. A single well could hold millions of gallons of wastewater or gas. As with um, all oil and gas infrastructure, there are explosion risks and other dangers associated with injection wells. Um, this photo is from a 2001 explosion uh, where gas was leaking underground from an injection well and it traveled uh, over seven miles and exploded seven miles away from the uh, injection well and resulted in two fatalities. This is a photo of the Bayou Corn Sinkhole in Assumption Parish, Louisiana. It was owned and operated by Occidental Petroleum Company, uh, a Texas brand. Occidental Petroleum and operated by a Texas brine company. This was a collapsed uh, injection well and it spans 37 acres and is 750 feet deep. So the ethane along with chemicals called plasticizers are manufactured into plastics at a facility called an ethane cracker. And this is a photo of one. The ethane goes through a series of chemical reactions to be turned into ethylene, which is then strung into polyethylene. Plasticizers give the plastic its desirable characteristics like flexibility and contribute to air pollution from these facilities. The market has been filled with cheap single use plastics in part because of the fracking boom. Plastics manufacturing infrastructure is rapidly expanding in the US. The photo shows uh, this photo is an unfinished ethane cracker in the Ohio River Valley uh, in Beaver County, Pennsylvania. It's the first such facility in the Appalachian region. But the American Chemistry Council predicts that the region could support uh, up to five ethane crackers. Once completed and operational, this facility will pump out 18 million tons of virgin polyethylene every year and uh, will contribute the equivalent air pollution as 400,000 additional cars on the road. Virgin plastic production itself is expected to quadruple by 2050 without uh, regulatory intervention. The production of plastics contributes largely to environmental injustice and environmental racism. The production infrastructure is usually cited in low income and black, brown and indigenous communities contributing to disproportionate health problems in those communities and lower quality of life. The extraction and production of plastics also has major climate impacts, especially from methane emissions. Plastics also release emissions as they break down into microplastics in waterways or landfills and, or when they are burned in incinerators. If plastics were a country, it would be the fifth largest greenhouse gas emitter tied with Russia with an estimated 1.7 gigatons of emissions every year, or twice that of the entire aviation industry. 
So I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but the international scientific community agrees that we have less than 10 years to, to avert the worst consequences of climate change. Uh, this photo is of Rise St. James, a community-based environmental justice group in St. James Parish, Louisiana. Formosa Plastics, which is a Taiwan-based company, wants to build the largest plastic manufacturing plant in the US on 2,500 acres in St. James in an historically black community that is already affected by heavy industry, including Marathon and Bolero. Not only is the Formosa site, uh, which sits on a, not only is the Formosa site uh, located on hundreds of acres of imperiled wetlands, it's also on a former sugarcane plantation, which contains the graves of people who were enslaved, whose descendants are alive today. And this is a really unfortunate pattern in places like Cancer Alley, where uh, a large part of the land is former plantation. Every plantation would have had a burial site for the people who were enslaved there. And uh, many of their stories have been lost, but St. James wants to remember them. And this is a photo of them honoring those graves during a Juneteenth celebration. So the end result of the ethane uh, raw materials being turned into plastic is nurdles. Polyethylene is manufactured into nurdles, tiny pieces of plastic, which are then made into many types of plastic products like bags and artificial turf. The nurdles are their own major source of pollution because they spill wherever they're transported. They're basically glitter. It's estimated that 250,000 tons of nurdles leak into waterways each year from plastic production facilities. If you wanna learn more about uh, the petrochemical expansion in the US, I highly recommend this 2019 report from Food and Water Watch. Also just follow Food and Water Watch because they're an amazing organization and they put out um, some of the best research that I've seen on this issue. So now uh, we have a new plastic product after that whole uh, supply chain. Since 1950, the world has produced more than 8 billion tons of plastic. That means that there is more than one ton of plastic for every person on earth. Globally, nearly 400 million tons of virgin plastic are produced annually, and nearly half of that new plastic is single use. Less than 9% of plastic waste has been recycled. Only 2% has been effectively recycled, meaning it wasn't eventually disposed of. It is estimated that a third of all plastic waste has found its way into the environment. So I want everyone to think of that in terms of recycling if we can't collect the plastic waste. And I know that this is the College and University Recycling Coalition, but I'm building up an argument here about plastic and recycling that I hope is very obvious. Plastic has huge impacts on wildlife. The most documented impacts have been those to marine life. Thousands of marine animals mistake plastic for food in waterways. And this is an infamous photo of an albatross chick. Sadly, once the animal has died, the plastics remain and can go on to hurt another animal. Humans are also ingesting plastics. Plastic pollution in the environment breaks down into microplastics, which contaminate our food, air, and water. One study found that the average person ingests a credit card's worth of, of plastics every week from plastic pollution. Plastics disproportionately affect babies and children. Chemicals and plastics that are injected can act as in, in, ingested, not injected, <laughs> can act as endocrine disruptors. And in January of this year, Italian researchers published findings that microplastics are even prevalent in the human placenta. A PSA for everyone here about bottled water, um, another reason that we all need access to clean drinking water. And also chemicals and, pl and plasticizers can be used to line food packaging. PFOAs, uh, fluorinated chemicals or forever chemicals can be used as a grease proof barrier in packaging. Um, they are also used in compostables, uh, so bad news there. I would avoid compostables uh, if you can in favor of reuse and refill. Um, we don't want forever chemicals in our bodies or our compost and many hard compostables don't get composted anyway, they simply contaminate compost. Also, less than 5% of compostable packaging um, actually gets composted. 
I'm going to show you here briefly. I love the screenshot. Some of the faces that are lobbying hard for an expansion in petrochemicals. This is a screenshot of a press conference held by the American Chemistry Council around the time that the Breakthrough from Plastic Pollution Act of, of 2021 was introduced. Among many actions, the Breakthrough from Plastic Pollution Act comprehensively excludes chemical and advanced recycling from the legal definition of recycling. Um, so we know that uh, recycling of plastics has been a huge failure, and some legal scholars argue that it's been an illegal deception of the public and regulators. Now plastic makers are pushing what they call advanced or chemical recycling, uh, which in truth is just turning plastic waste into fuel and not true recycling. Um, this diagram kind of helps show what chemical recycling is. The process is very expensive and outside of laboratories, it doesn't successfully turn plastic waste into new monomers. Out of more than 30 chemical recycling facilities built since 2000, just three are in operation and all of them turn plastic waste into fuel. According to the Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives, for every one ton of plastic waste processed through uh, chemical or advanced recycling, quotes, three tons of greenhouse gas emissions are produced. Okay, so that's it for the doom and gloom. Uh, so everyone breathe a sigh of relief. Now we get to uh, the good part and what my job is, which is what the heck are we going to do about all of this? Well, first of all, um, it's really lucky that you are associated with universities because we need to get this issue in front of as many people as possible. Um, we also need to empower those people to take public action. Um, and, and this is a, a screenshot of our flyer. For, we offer a Beyond Plastic Pollution course through Bennington College. We teach it two to three times a year, or our president, Judith Ang, teaches it. Um, this is a basically a deep in-depth dive of everything I just went over on plastics, but it also um, teaches you public action skills and what to do about it. And then you can get involved with me and start organizing if you want to. Um, something that we want to do at Beyond Plastics is take this course and build it so that other colleges and universities um, can teach it at their schools. So if you can, if you know how to do this or you have connections at your school and you can offer a course on plastic pollution, that can be a really powerful thing to do. Um, and part of educating people also means educating reporters and lawmakers. We need to build a grassroots movement to pass legislation that will address this problem. And uh, as we build that movement, we need to recognize that this is an intersectional issue. This is a climate issue. It's a voting issue. It's a racism issue. It's a labor issue and a health issue. So again, my role at Beyond Plastics uh, is I work with my colleagues to support grassroots organizers. I meet with volunteers around the country uh, who are working on the plastics issue. Recently, a group in Illinois that, sorry, that I work with uh, was able to get their Congress member, Brad Schneider, to co-sponsor the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. They did this by organizing constituent meetings. They tabled at the farmer's market where they had a postcard mail-in and they went to town halls. The grassroots movement is also growing on campuses. This is another thing universities can do. Um, and this is something I would encourage everyone here to participate in if you're not already, is to help students organize and help students lead the way in eliminating single use plastics on campus. Uh, this is some of the accomplishments that State University of New York at uh, New Paltz students uh, were able to do through student organizing. And you can find a fact sheet on vending machines at our website at beyondplastics.org slash act. California State University took it a step further. You probably already know this in your circles, but they banned single use plastics altogether. You can download their policy from our website and try to get it passed on your campus, um, or just do an internet search for California State University plastic policy. I love this policy because it's literally one page long. Another thing you can do is host a screening of the story of plastic. This is an Emmy nominated documentary from the story of stuff. And apparently the Emmys were last night. I didn't even realize, so I don't know if they won 
uh, best, best uh, documentary writing or not. Uh, we use this film a lot for organizing. Uh, we usually have a screening of it and then we'll have a panel afterward. Another thing you can do, and I made this little GIF, uh, GIF is a toxic tour, a toxic tour of your community. This is where you get uh, people on a bus and you basically drive them around your community and show them um, all the frontline uh, neighborhoods that you're dealing with and where where the industry is. Um, it's more like a reality tour, uh, but this is a really great way to connect uh, with your community and all you need is a bus and somebody who knows the issues to you know, talk about them. So with that being said, I'm glad I have enough time because I'm gonna take you on a little toxic tour through my community and kind of give you an example of what this looks like. So um, at the beginning, I mentioned that I have worked with frontline communities and um, we're facing a lot of waste incineration issues in the capital region of New York. One of those issues is uh, this cement plant, the Lafarge Holcomb cement plant. This is an international company in Ravina, New York. This company wants to burn millions of used tires every year as fuel in its cement kiln. And tires are made of synthetic rubber, which is basically plastic. When you burn them, you get all kinds of nasty emissions. But the big thing about this facility is it's located right across the street from a school. Um, literally, here's the smokestack that we were just looking at. I hope you can see this. And then about 400 feet away is the Ravina Queen and Selkirk High School and Middle School. So when you burn tires and uh, plastics, you get lead emissions, mercury emissions. This can cause learning disabilities. So this has caused a huge uh, grassroots fight in this community, which is only about 2000 people. Um, the Queemans Clean Air Coalition has been campaigning for about two years to stop this facility from burning tires. Another, um, waste facility uh, is BioHighTech in the city of Rensselaer. Um, it hasn't been built yet, it's just been proposed, but this is kind of what it would look like if it were built. This facility is basically a giant indoor landfill. They truck in municipal waste and they separate out the paper and the plastic. They shred that and they sell it for fuel. Um, this is the site where they wanna build it. It is the former BASF uh, site. So it is a current hazardous waste landfill that has a cap on it. It's right next to the Hudson River and it's less than a mile away from the Rensselaer Housing Authority, which is the low income housing neighborhood in this city. Um, so this really further entrenches our fossil fuel based economy because the waste um, if you're going to burn it, it has to be processed first, either through chemical recycling or mechanical shredding. But all of those processes require heavy trucks and transport and large facilities, and then eventually they get burned in someone's neighborhood. Um, I mentioned that burning waste has major pollution impacts, including dioxin. Dioxin is the same ingredient in Agent Orange. So you get that when you burn paper and plastic together, but also heavy metals and volatile organic compounds. And it just doesn't make sense uh, economically. We could be investing in reuse and refill and create generating uh, 200 times as many jobs at the end of uh, life of a product than through landfill or incineration. This is from the Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives, another really incredible organization putting out good research and really leading the way um, against chemical and advanced recycling and incineration. Another site in my community is 1011 Second Avenue, also called the Sacred Forest. This is a 10 acre forest uh, in the city of Troy on the Hudson River. It's the last forest on the Hudson River in the city of, of Troy. Um, and it contains artifacts from uh, the Mohican people and the Scaticoke First Nation people dating back about 3000 years. So this is a very important indigenous site, but a developer wants to purchase this land and build uh, high rise apartments and a marina on this site. Uh, instead of, you know, 
what I think should be done, which is giving it back to the indigenous peoples whose land was stolen in the first place. Um, so there is a grassroots movement also against the development of this site uh, in Troy. And the last one I have is Norlight. Uh, this is a hazardous waste incinerator in the city of Cohoes, New York. Um, this is a photo I took. This is another photo I took. Um, this incinerator has been here since the 1950s. Um, they produce uh, aggregate, which is a construction material uh, in their kilns, but they fire those kilns with hazardous waste that is shipped from all over the country. They got a lot of attention in 2020 because it was revealed that they had been burning um, aqueous film forming firefighting foam, AFFF. Uh, which contains PFAS, uh, and they did this in secret for two years. The photo on the left is from MLK Junior Day this past January. So this is just this year. They had a hazardous waste spill and catch fire, and there was an open burn of the hazardous waste. Um, this was their second fire in less than a year. This facility doesn't burn plastics, but I always include it because it just shows the risks of incineration are quite great. And also you can see on the map here, um, this is the facility, here's the smokestacks, and literally about 400 feet away is this little low income housing project. So the people who live here um, do not get a choice where they live, they live in subsidized housing and they are constantly living under um, things like the smoke. Oh, uh, the last one, I, I have one more. It's the Dunn landfill in the city of Rensselaer. These are all in the capital district of New York. This is a construction of and debris landfill. It's operated by Texas based waste connections. Um, it's a 99 acre landfill and it's located right next to the Rensselaer Junior Senior High School. Literally there's their ball diamond. And this is this right here is the landfill. There is also a grassroots movement here um, that has been very vocal about wanting to get this landfill shut down. Um, so, uh, I want to end on a note with the power of healing. Um, this is an event we did. If you're planning to organize, I encourage you to incorporate healing some way into your organizing. We decided to plant sunflowers around Norlight because um, sunflowers are hyper accumulators. They accumulate lead and heavy metals. And it wasn't to like really remediate the soil, but it was more of a symbolic gesture and healing thing. And we have dozens of people come out to plant sunflowers with us. And um, this action was inspired by uh, lifelong peace activist, Kathy Kelly. Um, I really admire her. She came to the sanctuary once. Uh, in the 1980s, Kathy Kelly was arrested uh, and spent a year in prison for planting corn on nuclear silos. Um, so that uh, sunflower planting was in, inspired by her. Um, and also have fun with it. I love to make memes to get things across and I like to post them on Reddit and things like that or use them to get people's attention. Um, these memes are just about plastics and they're really anybody can do memes. Um, so that being said, uh, in summary, we must reduce plastics at the source. Um, they are a product of the fossil fuel economy, and while some are beneficial due to their unique properties as a material, the vast majority of plastics are single use and disposable. They're flawed by design, and they are designed to be used briefly and then disposed of, and yet they persist for centuries. Um, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I strongly encourage you to follow Beyond Plastics and um, get on our mailing list. If you want to organize with us, I do community organizing and would love to work with you and um, happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Alexis, for sharing um, and taking us on quite an unfortunate journey, but I really um, especially appreciate that you offer hope and solutions. And um, so thank you so much for all of the wonderful advocacy work that you're doing and, and for sharing um, stories of hope and you know, advocates across the nation really appreciate that. So we do have a few questions. Um, I'll just get started here. This first one is a two part question. Um, what is the percentage of wells on public versus private land? And would you say that this is more an issue regarding private land owners 
or the federal government leasing BLM land or something else? A great question. I don't know the proportion of um, wells on private versus public land. Um, I do know that uh, there has been a push to stop oil and gas exploration on public lands. Um, but I think in the terms of the private land wells, in a lot of cases, those landowners were deceived by the gas company uh, on what was going to actually be done to their land. And um, that is a, a real tragedy. Thank you, Alexis. Next question. Um, hang on just a sec, sorry. Does the statistic that the plastics industry is in the top five emitters if it were a country, if, is that just production or does it include disposal? The, those are the life cycle impacts. So production to disposal. Okay, thank you. And then I have a comment here to share. One second, sorry, I'm having trouble with my chat. Operator error, but still. <laughs> do, do we could have people unmute themselves to ask questions. Will that be okay? Yeah, absolutely. I'll read this um, this quick comment to you, and then we could absolutely unmute for sure. So, just um, driving north south on on New York Interstate eighty seven, I've always wondered what that long conveyor tube was in Ravina that goes under the highway. I've been seeing it for years now. I know it's from the Lafarge Jay plant. Thank you. Yeah, you can so, see yes, that we, stack for miles. Yeah. <laughs> so we have time, absolutely, I think, to um, let people unmute and ask questions if people would like. Hi, Alexis. I'll, I, can, I can get started. My name is Safa. Um, I'm in Canada. I work in Toronto with Humber College. And my question to you, it's kind of like a two-parter. Um, but my focus is on waste reduction and kind of teaching students the importance of that. And I also work with the custodial company on campus. Um, but we wanted to understand how to make it a more engaging topic with students and staff at the same time and not just keep saying reduce your waste or reduce your plastic. But how do we kind of get into that into more of a behavioral aspect if you if you have any tips for me? So the way. Um... Beyond, uh, SUNY New Paltz did it was they had a first they had a screening of the story of plastic which is a very informative movie and then they had a panel on it with our president um, Judith Ank and that panel was all about how students can organize on campus uh, to tackle this issue so it, yes absolutely we need behavior change but I think we should take it a step further and do organizing and um what is the word institutional change so organizing for reduce and reuse on campuses um, and uh, you have to make students I think a large part of it is students people just aren't aware of how big this issue is it's a very silent emergency and um, getting it in front of them and making them feel like they can do something about it is the magic equation Awesome. Thank you so much. So while we're waiting, Alexis, there's a couple more in the chat. So I'll bring one up because I think it'd be really valuable for everyone to hear. Um, tips for communicating. Do you have tips for communicating the many issues with plastics and plastic recycling without undermining all of the campus recycling programs? Um, yeah. I found that many people interpret critiques of recycling as they should just throw everything into the trash. For us, that goes to an incinerator. Yeah, great question. So I do not want to undermine recycling at all. And cycling, recycling is very important. And, and we need to, as a country, um, we need to really invest in our recycling infrastructure and make it more robust. Same with our composting infrastructure. So glass, cardboard, paper, uh, metals, we need to make sure that we are recycling those. As for plastics, you can not focus on recycling so much, but on uh, reuse and refill. 
So replacing water bottles, uh, water bottle sales on campus with um, refillable water bottle, those refill stations, getting them out of vending machines, getting them out of your campus dining surfaces. Um, and also you don't want to put dirty plastic or plastic bags in the recycling because it jams up the recycling infrastructure anyway. So I hope that answered your question, but I but do let the, the incinerator part of that is really important. People should know where their waste is going. Where is it being burned? Do people know that it's being burned? Do people know that there are people that probably live next to that incinerator, things like that? So another question that came in is um, about how communities can get started with organizing some tips on getting started um, and then getting connected specific, specifically to Beyond Plastics. We do have the specific link in the chat, but if you have some more to share on that question, it'd be great. Yeah, again, I think the best way to get started is to have a, an event where you show this, uh, the story of plastic and you do a panel on it and that really gets the issue out there. And then you wanna also have easy things that people can do to get involved. Um, if you want to get involved with Beyond Plastics, I do a bi-weekly uh, grassroots organizing meeting and we are focused on the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. This meeting is focused on grassroots lobbying, so teaching people how to have a constituent meeting with their representatives, how to hold a town hall, how to have a rally, how to write a letter to the editor or an op-ed. Um, all those civic engagement skills are part of this. And I find that people don't, I never knew how to do those things until I came to the Sanctuary for Independent Media, but that's really where a lot of power is because um, engage, those are your free speech rights. Those are your first amendment rights and they are very, very powerful uh, to utilize. So um, start with a screening of the story of plastic, have everyone write to your con congressional representative, find out if they're a co-sponsor of the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, and then try and get a single use plastic ban passed on your campus. Alexis, I have a question about um, speaking of the single use plastic bans. It's my understanding and I could be I could be wrong um, that many of the single use plastic bans, like the one in California, shout out to Virginia and Rob and other folks in neighboring state to Maryland, um, that allows for bioplastics. So the compostable plastics that you were talking about that also are not necessarily getting composted or um, you know have their own issues chemically. Um, so is that, of concern um, or you know, is, is that a bridge? I mean, you know, like just wanted to kind of point that out that a lot of us are, you know, talking about single use plastic bans, but there's still a lot of single use plastic that either will be generated more so to kind of replace the petroleum based plastic or, or what have mm -hmm. you. So just your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a really good point. And it's very confusing because there's very little regulation around what the definitions are. So bioplastic, it could mean plastic that's technically compostable in an industrial composter, or it could just mean regular plastic that's manufactured from like corn instead of fossil fuels. So if you don't know the diff which one it is and there's no labeling requirements, you, it's hard, it's impossible to tell what kind of plastic you're dealing with. Um, and the second thing is we definitely don't wanna replace um, single use with compostables, especially not the hard compostables. Um, so I didn't know that about the California State University policy, but as with any policy, the devil's in the details and you got to work, you have to be very specific in the text on what your intention is going to be with that policy. Um, so the best, um, the best, I meant to include this in my, um, my presentation, I forgot, um, but there's post landfill action network or plan they have case studies on schools that do reuse and refill uh, systems and how successful they were so the gold standard is reuse and refill and um, there's not a lot of economic support for anyone who wants to do reuse and refill at this point um, because plastic is so heavily subsidized but that can change and I, I hope it does. Thanks, whoever put the post plan in the chat. 
there. Check them out. They're really good. Yeah, Alexis, while you're um, talking about compostables, um, you mentioned less than 5% of compostable packaging gets composted. Um, and a question came in, you know, that it might be very helpful in working and promoting reusables. Do you happen to know the source of that stat off the top of your head or could you share it? Off the top of my head, I don't, but I can find it for you. Okay, great. Thank you. So another um, question, do you have more information on how the CSU policy was drafted and approved? Was it student led? Seems like quite a heavy lift for such a large state. I don't, I don't know how, I just know that they passed it. Um, I would read the policy. It's literally two paragraphs long. It's very simple. It just says no plastic bottles will be sold on campus. No plastic blah will be bags on campus, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but the SUNY New Paltz, that was student-led organizing. That was students meeting uh, on a biweekly basis. They met with the director of campus fulfillment services. They met with their sustainability officer. They did Instagram polls to reach the campus at large. They did art installations um, a lit of litter cleanups to kind of bring this to the awareness of the campus at large. They did a lot of work. Well, we'll we'll give a couple of minutes here and see if others um, would like to chime in and, and take yourself off mute to chime in with any last minute questions. I uh, that someone in the chat mentioned the story of plastics did win an Emmy at the award ceremony. So Yay. news and writing documentary, a specific kind of documentary, I think. Yes, it's free to watch on YouTube uh, through November. So go watch it. It was produced by a filmmaker in the capital region of New York, actually, uh, Dea Schlossberg. Um, it's a great film. I'm going to put my email in the chat. Um, anybody feel free to reach out to me, see what we're doing. And also, I think you're going to get some uh, links and resources in the follow up email after this conference. So thank you all for hosting me. This was a delight. I appreciate you all. So Alexis, one more question in the chat I'll read. I think it's a great one. Um, any tips for engaging campus staff? Um, feel they're often get overlooked and are eager to help. Yeah, I mean, you should consider them allies in student organizing. Students who are gonna lead this really just need to find the decision makers at their campus and that can be really hard. So um, I, think, I think you should consider yourself like a helper for the students. And um, you should think about your networks and connections also and see what kind of leverage you have, who you can talk to, um, invite the staff and faculty to the story of plastic screening, make this like a, a campus community issue and like a community at large issue and, and make people feel included. I think organizing really works when there, there's a sense of community, there's a sense like everyone has a seat at the table and everyone can weigh in on the issue and just like people feel in, in, like they are included um, in the decision making. Thank you. And thank you again so much for being here and joining us. This has been really wonderful. Thank you all. Get in touch, please. Um, okay, well, thank you. Uh, thanks, Jen, for, for running yeah. the beginning of this uh, wonderful workshop so far. Um, and thank you, Alexis. I mean, your presentation is it's critically important for all of us. And, um, you know, we in Kirk, we've been talking a lot about, you know, our organization and, and even just the name of the organization being the Recycling Coalition and, and all of us on this call and in the board and um, we all understand, I think, that, um, you know, recycling is sort of um, what people gravitate towards. And, and we know that we need to move up that zero waste hierarchy and, um, and really focus our efforts upstream in reducing waste and particularly being mindful of the materials that are, um, are being used to generate products that come onto our campuses. And then, you know, we're, we're kind of stuck 
um, dealing with them, but um, but really that those upstream consequences are are much bigger, um, oftentimes than the downstream disposal consequences. But we want to address both. But clearly, we need to we need to look upstream. So, thank you for that. Um, and thank you to everyone in attendance today. I'm really excited that you joined us. Um, so I'm Leanna Hauser. I'm the Waste Reduction and Recycling Manager for Johns Hopkins University. And I'm also the Vice Chair uh, for Kirk. I'm thrilled and honored to introduce our, uh, our guest speakers today who are all committed and passionate individuals working to support equitable, just, and sustainable efforts towards a zero waste and healthy society through our Community Connections case studies. Our first presenter is Ben Kelscher, who will focus on integrating social sustainability into their student internship program. Ben has served in the Texas A&M Office of Sustainability since 2010. He earned a Master's of Arts in Sociology from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and a Master of Water Management from Texas A&M. In the Office of Sustainability, his core job function is running an internship program devoted to creating a culture of sustainability through action and outreach. Ben advocates for incorporating social justice into sustainability and strives to build diverse, dynamic, and inclusive teams. So welcome, Ben. We are looking forward to hearing from you today. Yeah, thank you so much, Liana. Um, it's nice to, to, meet, to meet you formally here. It's nice to have, see everyone here on the call. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Uh, should I just go ahead and share my screen whenever I'm ready? Yep, please do. All right, well, before I share my screen, I'm just gonna warn y'all that this uh, presentation slide deck is a little bit cheesy. Uh, this is a, a presentation that I uh, uh, I was reached out to, to provide about a couple of weeks ago. And I don't know about y'all, but October is really busy for us in the sustainability world. Uh, so I, I, I wanted to redo the slide deck, quite honestly, because it was, uh, you'll see, it's a little cheesy. I think it's kind of fun. Um, but it was like a team presentation that I did. And um, it, the theme is it's amusing. So I wanted to change it, but hey, we'll go with it. And you know, hopefully you all enjoy it. But uh, so here's what we got here today. Um, so uh, we're calling it a new hope uh, training social sustainabilistas. And as you can see, a very cheesy Star Wars theme presentation. Um, but hopefully the content won't, won't be so cheesy. So I just wanted to get that out of the way. Um, but I guess first I'll just say that, yeah, my name is Ben Kelscher. I'm uh, the assistant manager here in the Texas A&M Office of Sustainability. Uh, I've worked here since 2010 as a grad student, and I've been full-time since 2013. So one of the first things that I did was create an internship program. Um, and I guess what I, I should also mention that my background academically is in sociology, um, where um, the main area that I focused on was like race and ethnicity, um, racism in the United States. Um, and then I moved here to, to Texas and uh, got a degree in water management. But then I, that's how I ended up getting involved in sustainability. So I come into this field from a very different perspective, I think, than most people uh, who are typically coming in from the environmental perspective. And I guess what I wanted to say first is uh, sustainability, you know, what is it? Um, in case you're not, not aware, uh, so it, we try to look at these three main areas, which is the environment, which is uh, the economy, and then also um, social justice. Um, so that's really what we're trying to achieve in sustainability is balancing these three, three things that we can have a healthy environment, if we can have a healthy economy that's you know, available and open to people and we're able to get return on investments for things um, and think long term. And then if we can have make sure that people are being treated fairly and equally, that people have, you know, equal chances and um, outcomes are, you know, are closer and things like that. So that is what sustainability, the ideal of it is. And like the textbook definition is meeting the definition, me meeting the needs of um, future generations, you know, uh, basically meeting your current needs without sacrificing the needs of future generations. That's like the textbook definition. Um, but we really look at it in these three areas. It's very holistic and it, everything kind of is joined together. Um, so that's basically what sustainability is in like a nutshell. Um, and the thing about it is, though, is most people, when they think about sustainability, they really only think about the environment and the economics. So they kind of think about if I install solar panels, would it have a return on my investment? When would that return on my investment be? Is that a good economic decision or not? Um, but sustainability really, at the end of the day, is about people. Um, and we don't always think as much about this social equity piece um, in, in, in our industry. 
And I'll say when I gave this presentation, that was a lot really, really accurate. But in the last, I would say, three, four, five years, um, sustainability has really uh, started to really embrace the social side of sustainability. So what we do is we call that social sustainability. Um, so that's really taken off in our industry in the last few years. In fact, it's like the main theme of the biggest conference in sustainability this year in just a couple of weeks, the AC conference. Um, so, you know, that is changing. But I do think that it's not as probably valued or people don't have as much of uh, understanding of what it actually is. So um, I'm not going to like, I guess I'm what I'm not, I'm not going to be able to explain all of the details of it that would, you know, create that would, that would take a lot of time. But what I want to talk about is how I have tried to incorporate social sustainability into our internship program. Um, so first, I'll just start with, um, you know, we, we created our internship program in the summer, summer of 2011. Uh, we noticed other schools had programs and we probably should do the same. Um, what ended up happening was uh, Holly, she's the student um, on the left of screen, second from the left. Um, she uh, actually just approached our office and she wanted to be an intern. You know, she asked if we had any opportunities and my boss, Kelly and I were on the far right of screen. Um, we were like, yeah, I mean, yeah, let's bring her on board. We didn't really have a process in place. We didn't, you know, really even have an interview process. We just thought we should get started. And after that um, first summer, it went really well. And I was like, hey, I have a few friends of mine. Um, they might, they were also interested in being interns. Could we grow the team? And we're like, yeah, um, probably should have a few members on our team. So this was our first iteration of our first sustainability internship team back in 2011. And I mean, I loved working with these, these ladies. Uh, it was a great experience. Um, but, you know, what I realized is that we weren't really uh, living sustainably. So sustainability is really, you know, it's about, it's about diversity. It's about being inclusive. It's about being welcoming. It's about being interdisciplinary. That's a big part of sustainability. It's uh, trying to get people from all the different areas to come together and, and think about things and solve problems, solve grand challenges that the world faces. Um, because, you know, one perspective is never going to really solve that problem. You need multiple perspectives. And what we realized is, is that we really only had like kind of one kind of way of thinking in our program. All of our students um, were white identified and all of our students were actually like environmental studies students. So there was, you know, everyone was coming from the same, uh, not everyone obviously has different lived experiences, um, but similar backgrounds and, you know, the same academic programs. So the, the way that everyone was being trained to think um, was very similar. Um, so that wasn't interdisciplinary and it certainly wasn't diverse. Um, so what we decided to do is we wanted to make our program to be like, if we want to teach people to live sustainably, we have to make sure our program is also sustainable as well. So we have to make sure it's diverse, it's inclusive, it has students from all across campus. Um, so what we, what I did is I basically just reached out to different programs, um, different departments on campus, like let's say psychology or sociology, where I knew students care, like were interested in social justice issues. Um, so I just sent out targeted emails let people know that this internship program is for everybody. It doesn't matter what your major is. It doesn't matter if you care about the environment or not. You know, as long as you care about one of these areas, we can, you know, that you might have a place for, for us here in this program. Um, and it, it worked really well, actually. The, the first semester, we had a far more variety in our program. This was, you know, the next the next time we, we, we created the new team, fall 2012. Um, and you can already see the diversity of the team has increased a little bit. Um, and it's not just like people are coming from different backgrounds. People are also coming from different academic majors. You know, we have international studies now. We have bioenvironmental sciences now. We have meteorology. We have an English student. And it really was transformative. You know, the people's ideas that they had for outreach. We had all, just so many different ways of thinking and knowing and different perspectives. And I think it really, you know, it really created a really, uh, really cool dynamic in our team. Um, and one, one thing that I really figured out was that after a few semesters of doing targeted advertising, I didn't actually have to do targeted advertising anymore because representation is really, really important. And, um, you know, our program is very visual. So we have a really strong social media presence. We take a lot of pictures and things like that. Um, we do a lot of outreach on campus. So, um, you know, it's come is now you know, uh, students on campus, they, they're they able to see themselves reflected in the, the people that are in our office. Um, so we're, we get a lot more applicants, diverse applicants, just because representation is just so important. If you can see that, you know, this is a program where people that, you know, look like me are welcomed and they're valued, 
um, this is a great opportunity for me on campus, you're going to have a lot more applications. So I don't even have to send targeted applications anymore. Um, and then this is all of the students that we've had minus the current uh, 10 that we have right now. Um, we've had over 115 students and um, over 50% of our students identify as students of color. And for our university, that's substantial because our university is about 20% students of color. Um, and we've had representation from every single college on campus. So all of the colleges have been represented. Um, you know, so I mean, really the people are what makes our program, you know, these students, uh, they're, they're the, what, what makes our program what it is. So that's kind of just the background of the program. Um, but it's one thing to, it's one thing to, uh, you know, create a more diverse program to give people from different backgrounds and things like that and bring them together onto a team. That's one thing, you know, um, but you have to make sure that it's a genuine and you have to spend time, you know, team building and really getting to know each other. Because the reality is, is that all of these folks are coming from different places. They're, they have different ways of thinking and knowing. Um, so how do we make sure that they're able to really get to learn from and know each other really well? Um, so what we really like to do, um, well, I guess I'm getting a little ahead of myself on the presentation, um, but um, I, the first thing you have to do is you have to make sure that social sustainability is a really important part of kind of like what you're doing and teaching. So like, how do you define sustainability, right? Um, a lot of times when you hear, see that definition of sustainability, you won't actually hear the word social justice. You won't hear, you won't hear things talking about race or racism. You won't talk about patriarchy or gender or homophobia or any of those issues. Um, you know, you'll just talk about maybe like bringing people together and solving problems interdisciplinary, but you're not actually like centering race in any conversations or centering gender or really kind of looking at issues from that, that frame of mind, that lens. So first you have to just define sustainability from that social justice kind of perspective. Um, and then also how do you define social sustainability? And I think I've already kind of covered this, but I could just talk about my health and my wellness. Um, I don't have to talk about race or racism or white supremacy or any of the issues like that that we have in our society. Um, so I think that's also really important if you want to have a, a, you know, a socially sustainable program, if you want to bring diverse students there, you have to be genuine and authentic. Um, and then team building is just key. You know, you have to team build. It's so important to, to team build um, when you have people that don't know each other. Even if everyone's coming from the same college, I think team building is super valuable. But I think it's a big part of our program. So we spend the first few weeks really team building. Um, so just some of the stuff we do for team building is we do mini presentations. Um, we do uh, go to this place called Challenge Works. We take a team photos and we do icebreakers and wines and shines. So the mini presentations, this is simply like, so this is a the internship. Their job is outreach. They're outreach specialists. Um, so this is uh, this assignment. It, it kind of uh, covers two different things, you know. Um, one, it gives them a chance to present to the group. It gives them a chance to show, you know, how, you know, kind of how they're, where they're at as a presenter when they first enter the program. So it gives me a chance to evaluate kind of what they need to work on, how they can improve. Um, but the main thing is it's literally just a presentation about themselves. That's all it is. They have about five to 10 minutes um, and they can tell us anything that they want about themselves. You know, we typically if people follow the format kind of like childhood, um, growing up, parents, family, hobbies, loved ones, you know, things like that. Um, but we give them a uh, freedom, you know, uh, we've had a person write a rap song, we've had a person play a song on like a banjo, um, you know, we've had people do some art, some cool stuff like that, um, but typically just a PowerPoint presentation. And we do that on like the, 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 the second meeting, the second meeting. So the first meeting, um, all of our, our supervisors, myself and the other staff in the office, we give our presentation and then they have a chance to do theirs the next week. So that's one thing. Um, and then this is really fun. We take them to this place called Challenge Works. Um, basically what you do is it's high and low ropes, um, which I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with that, but basically you do like cool, like little um, activities where you kind of like have to use your imagination and solve some made up problem that's challenging, but it takes teamwork. Um, so in this picture, we, we had to pretend that this bucket in the water was glycerin and we couldn't spill a drop of it and we had to like sing a song and it was really fun. We had to like use a rope. I don't know. It was really fun, but it's like team bonding things that really bring you together and you're solving problems together. Um, and then after that, you do high ropes. So that's where you're really challenging yourself. So I think throughout the whole thing, when you're, when you want to make your program socially sustainable, you know, training is a huge part of everything. So it's like you're doing the team building, but you're also challenging people individually. 
And this is a thing where, you know, the person in this picture, she didn't have a fear of heights. She was able to do the whole thing. Some people actually have a fear of heights, you know, they may be only to take three steps, you know, maybe they only want to take two, we encourage them to take three, that's a win for them. So, you know, everyone's at a different level, we have to celebrate everybody, you know, in different ways. All right, so that's, that's that. Um, and then we just take a lot of team photos, you know, at the beginning of the semester, um, we'll take like this, the photo I have this here, I forgot this was here. But like, you can tell like this photo is terrible. Like, look at us, our arms are all at our sides. We don't even look, we know each other or like each other. We really like, like, who is this? We don't look like a team. We got polo, sure, but we don't look like a team. So we're just like even small things like block your arms. Suddenly we look like we like each other, right? So like, it's just something small like that. But this is like an example. This is our first team photo. It's like a professional team photo. This is about like week three or week four. Um, and then this is like later on in the semester where we know each other really well. We had like an event and we just got done with and boom, you know, this is where we're at towards the end, you know. Um, so to me, that's like that's a team. You can see you really built your team up. You know, it, it took time, though. You had to go through the steps through the processes. And the photos, I think, are just important because like it's something so small and so easy to do, but you can get a lot out of it. Like just taking photos, it can bring you together. I usually print them and give them to all the students. We have their photos from each semester. The uh, and in our office, we have a wall with all of the photos of all of the all of the teams from all of the students from every semester. Um, you know, you can post it on your social media. So there's just lots of different things you can do. But something so small and simple can actually bring you together too. And then this is something that um, I've you know, doing a little bit more recently, and especially because we've had to shift our program because of COVID, we we are mostly doing things virtually now. Um, so we're back to in-person this semester, but what, what we started doing is like, it's really hard to get to know people virtually. So you have to kind of create ways to do that. So I started just doing icebreakers at the start of every meeting, just random questions like, you know, like what's uh, something that makes you smile or who is a celebrity that you look like or who's your favorite animal or movie, whatever, just something simple that the people can answer. Um, and it just starts to kind of get the conversation flowing. You kind of get to know each other a little bit more. Um, and then we also do something called wines and shines. This is a, a something that my coworker came up with, my coworker Jesse. But basically, what this is is just like tell me a wine, so anything from today or from the week that you want to complain about. I think everyone it's always nice to complain about something. Feel like someone wants to listen to you. Like, I stubbed my toe, or I cut my hand cooking, or whatever. You know, I was sick, or my mom was sick, or whatever. Anything, any whatever it is, you know. Um, and then we don't want to leave it down on just the wine. So then the next thing we do is shines. So just anything that made you happy or put a smile on your face or something good that happened to you or whatever. Like I went to the movies and it was awesome. Or I got to talk to my mom today. Or, you know, I went to go see my, my, my nephew or my niece or my girlfriend or whatever it is, you know. So just something small like that. And, I, and uh, it's a little, it seemed a little silly to me at first, uh, I'll be honest. But as I've been doing it more and more, I see a lot of value in it. It's some, such a simple thing to ask. And it really gets, helps you to know each other on your team. And you get to know each other more and more every day. All right. And then this is just showing you all of that, lead, like, kind of leading up to this. This is one of our um, students. He actually was a, um, an undergrad, and now he's a graduate student in our office. But he's, this is kind of what he took out of everything. I found all of the people that work in the Office of Sustainability. Um, and the interns in the program to be the best part. I got to learn from so many people and every person has a unique experience and background and together our backgrounds created a welcoming atmosphere for everybody to learn from each other. Um, so that's just, to me, that's team built. You know, you go through all of those processes and that's how you get your team built, right? And obviously like we'd like to see like the takeaways and this is, you know, it's affirming that this was his experience, right? Um, and then the next thing is now that you have your team, you built your team, they know each other. But if you want to talk about social sustainability, you have to train. You have to train your team. You have to talk about issues. Um, so first we, we do like trainings as a team. So um, I give a presentation called the state of race. Um, we take field trips. Um, we go to campus events and we have guest speakers. Um, so this is just a, a picture of myself. I, a time I presented this at ASHE one year. Um, I told you my background at the start, uh, uh, sociology. So that's something that I've studied a lot academically. So I have a lot of background in that. So I give a lecture um, about racism in the United States. And I, I, you know, I don't really hold any punches or anything like that. And I talk about the history of racism 
um, you know, kind of like uh, the, the academic terms to understand what it looks like structurally. Um, and then examples, you know, and current day examples, political examples, social examples, uh, popular culture examples, just all kinds of things like that. Um, so I think that's really important in that, and really just centering the fact that racism is here to exist. Um, and, you know, it's not just like, it's like privileges as well. We talk about white privilege. So all kinds of issues are talked about in this presentation. And then that, and then we also give them a chance to talk as well, obviously, and discuss any ideas that they might have. Um, and we take some field trips. Um, so, and this is obviously uh, pre-COVID. So we've transitioned a bit, um, but there's a African American History Museum that's local in town. Um, and then this is not, you know, it's not just about, you know, race and racism. The Brazos Valley Food Bank, you know, going and helping people that are, you know, that are not able to get food as easily as others and things like that. So um, lots of different ways you can be socially sustainable. And then th this is where we're also getting to some other areas that you can look at. So um, there's like a day of silence on our campus. It's a day for LGBT, um, the LGBT, uh, LGBT plus, uh, Q plus, sorry, community um, to be recognized on our campus. Um, and so we like to come out to those kind of events and be supportive. And we saw these ladies, they looked really cool um, in front of this flag and we asked if we could take their picture um, and they agreed, you know, thankfully. And um, we were able to post this on our social media um, and then just kind of just another way to educate and spread awareness and, and things like that. And just celebrating people, you know, doing something cool. We caught them being sustainable by representing, you know, and supporting and being awesome advocates. Um, and then another thing that our campus does is we have this RISE conference, it's the Race, Identity, and Social um, Ethnicity Conference. And um, we host it recently in Aguiland. We have like our own version of it. So we have our students attend. You know, if it's in person, we have them attend in person. Um, if it's virtual, we have them attend virtual. So just another way for them to learn about social sustainability and issues on campus. Um, and then I also bring in guest speakers. I guess I forgot to. Um, stack these properly, these weren't supposed to come in at the same time. But uh, these are other areas we can think about. So salary negotiation, we, we bring in the Women's Resource Center and they lead a whole talk about salary negotiation and it's really, really impactful. Um, I think that's something that people don't think a lot about is money and finances and you know their, their economics. So this is where we try to look at like personal kind of uh, financial health and kind of economic sustainability a little bit more, but it's also social too because um, this program is really designed more geared for women um, because the um, research shows that women are not paid as, as well as men in the workforce, um, but it's beneficial for all. You know, I learned things, I'm a terrible negotiator. So I was like, yeah, taking notes, you know? Um, and then we also have the Money Education Center on campus and they just teach you like basically how to manage your money, investing opportunities, things like that. Um, we bring in guest speakers from multicultural services, um, we have Aggie allies come in um, and talk to us about the LGBTQIA um, plus community um, and how you can be a great ally to them. Um, and we talk about things like sexual assault and violence on campus. Um, and you know, we have this program called Green Dot about being a bystander and things like that. So just a lot of different examples of trying to bring in different perspectives um, into the program. All right, and then that's the team training, but then also they have to focus on the individual. How does the individual grow? Um, so one of the things we do is called Today in Sustainability News. Um, basically what they have to do is they work with a team of two or three students, and once every week they have to create a social media post. Um, and they can talk about any sustainability issue or challenge. It doesn't have to be social sustainability, um, but it's just kind of one area. And then um, whenever they have assignments, they have to do like research for presentations that they, they, I think I'm going to be getting into some of that too. They have to write literature reviews, so like peer reviewed journal articles and things like that. Um, and then they also have to do reflection assignments, which is basically like they have to answer questions looking inward, outward, and beyond or backwards or something like that. Um, but um, that's like required because we're in a high impact learning course, but they're actually really impactful. I think just sitting and thinking about things, connecting things from your class to your internship to your future can be useful and helpful. Um, and then, so all of that, they've been trained, you know, they, uh, they, they, the team's been built, they've been trained as a team, they've been trained individually. Now they're ready to go out and share knowledge. So how do we do that? Um, I'm going to just skip that part and go right to my slides because I know we're running a little bit late here. Um, so one thing we do is tabling. Uh, we do a lot of tabling. So we go out and we talk about social sustainability topics and issues at the tables. Um, we do presentations, you know, formal in-person presentations. We, we've done a lot of those in the past. We don't get the rooms full like we used to, unfortunately. 
Um, but we talk about um, social sustainability issues as well. And we also try to connect things. So it's like, if you're talking about an environmental issue, what are the economic components and what are the social components? So it doesn't have to only be social sustainability. Um, but then we've pivoted um, from in-person to virtual during the pandemic. So we also have virtual talks. And this is just an example where we've really come so far as a program. This first presentation was like about water resource issues. And this one is about the importance of intersectional environmentalism. That's just an area that you could look up if you want to learn more, but it's kind of an emerging, emerging field that I think is really important if you want to understand social sustainability. Um, and then this is another example where they, they talked about the cost and burden of environmental justice. Um, so just some examples of things that the students have created and come up with. Um, and then we do workshops, which are smaller in-person, very interactive activities. And um, the cool thing on, on the workshops here is that, uh, I don't know if you can see my arrow or not, but uh, the, we talked about like minorities in science here. We talked about combat team stereotypes um, and climate change. So um, this was our first time having a workshop where we specifically had like social sustainability, social justice topics. Before it was like, how do you fix your bike? How do you make dishwasher soap or whatever? Um, so we really, that's what we really did for this one. And it was amazing. And before we would have like a room full of almost every student was white identified. Almost every student was environmental studies. When we hosted this first workshop, it was the most diverse room I've ever been in on campus. It was crazy. Like I was like, wow. So like the topics that you present about are also going to help bring in a more diverse audience into your programs as well. Um, and then this is just, I guess, more examples of stuff we've done. I'm going to skip over this, but lots of different things. Climate change, environmental justice. Um, this was an entire workshop. The entire thing was social sustainability topics. And this was the interns, you know, I don't tell them what, what to do. You know, they decide what they want to do as well. I don't, I like to give them autonomy and ownership over what their assignments are. So this is just showing you if you, if you train, if you do this thing, you can, you know, your students are going to probably like get led down this path on their own, right? Um, and then we do big events. This is Campus Sustainability Day or it's Campus Earth Day. But this was a cool activity that this, our intern came up with. And it's an activity to learn more about the LGBT um, community. And it went really well. It had really positive um, results and stuff like that. So that was really cool. Um, and then the, the thing that they also do is so, social media. So I talked a little bit about today in sustainability news. They have to create a social media post. Um, and, um, you know, I don't tell them what it's about, but this is just an example. This is like an example of uh, um, fast fashion, um, but they looked at it environmentally. They looked at it socially. I think the next slide, it looks at it economically. Um, so I thought this was really cool. And I thought this connected a little bit to this particular um, conference, the, the Kirk, you know, obviously this is about recycling um, and, and things like that. Um, I'll be honest, I don't know a ton about Kirk, so I may be mis misspeaking here. Um, but you can see here, it's like fast fashion, uh, garment workers, and uh, where do all of these uh, microplastics and where do we send all of the clothing and things? And like, you know, 85% of all textiles are going to the landfill every year. So you can like look at recycling, you can look at landfill stuff, you can like look at, you can look at like physical processes like that, and you can put that into that social context in different ways. So that's another way you can try to kind of connect what you're doing and make it more uh, socially, um, I guess, I don't know, viable or connect more with people in that way. Um, because a lot of times like facts, just straight facts, people don't care. Like you have to hit them emotionally as well, right? Um, and then this is another example. Um, we did a post about Juneteenth and you can see here like it's Juneteenth, but it was also, um, it was also Pride Month as well, I, I believe. So like that's how we have this pride flag here have that in the same month. So it's like, we're kind of double dipping, but it's just another example of how we use our social media. And then this was an example of how we use our social media to take a really strong uh, stance and make a strong statement. Um, so this was really around um, when everyone did their blackout stuff all over Instagram and everything after, you know, after what happened with George Floyd in Minnesota. Um, and, you know, we wanted to make sure that people, you know, like th we, this is, I think people understand this about our office already, but this was a very strong statement, you know, that we condemn all acts of racism, intolerance, and discrimination, and we support, stand, and advocate for the Black community, and that you can't have a sustainable future if you don't have justice, you know, um, and the time for change is now, and Black Lives Matter, and, you know, obviously that's, a, that, you know, that can be taken politically or whatever, but this is really just about people and trying to make the world a better place for all the people that are in it, um, and we want to make sure that our office, people know that that's kind of who we are and what we stand for, and that also is the representation that I talked about. You know, these are the things where people are going to know, oh, this is for me. 
Um, this is something where I'm going to feel comfortable and valued and I might be interested in. Um, and then at the end of the day, what you want at the end of the day is you want your students to take what they've learned and, you know, bring it out into the world. And that's really, I think, what, you know, I've been, you know, really encouraged by is just seeing them have wonderful ideas. You kind of teach them a little bit about something that they haven't thought about and then they have their ideas and then they're learning and they're growing. Um, and it's just, it, it's really, it's really fun and, and I think enjoyable um, to really see that happen. And this is like just an example of our students having a really cool idea on this um, thing to talk about social sustainability in a very interactive and fun way. And she used story to do it and she was an English major. So she had people, people pick like an icon on the map and then tell them the story about the life cycle and how people are affected along the way and how our consumption, our consumer behavior is kind of driving that and how we should try to consume, you know, more, more, um, I guess, sustainably um, or more efficiently or not as wasteful. Um, and so it was just really cool to see all of those different ideas come together. But, you know, that's, those are the kind of things you can get when you have a more diverse mind in a room. You know, I wouldn't have thought about doing it through story and using kind of my English skills. Um, and then this is just, I just wanted to just kick it off, like end it with just a couple more quotes from students just to kind of see like what, how they've kind of synthesized things. And this is uh, Lily and she's saying, I think students should apply for the Office of Sustainability Internship Program if they are passionate about making the world livable for future generations. Do not let your major stop you. Diversity is key in sustainability and the intern work better when people are able to give their different perspectives. Um, and then um, finally, I wanted to end with Shreya who says this internship has taught me to critically evaluate society under a lens that evaluates all aspects of sustainability, economic, environmental, and social. I have learned so much by working with my fellow interns that come from different backgrounds, but all something different to offer. And through them and in the internship, I've gained a valuable experience I know I will always reference in my future endeavors. So that's the last line I just wanted to, that she will always reference, you know, and I was, I don't know if she just, we asked her to write something for social media, um, you know, so maybe she's blowing smoke, but, you know, I, I really do believe that the students get a lot out of this uh, program um, and they uh, are really able to kind of evolve and grow. And that's really what my goal is. And, you know, um, we're just fortunate to have them, quite honestly. These students make our program so much better. So everything we can do, you know, to, to support them and make sure that they have a safe, inclusive, welcoming space is really our goal. Um, so that's it. Um, hopefully, I'm, I know I'm probably a little bit longer than I was supposed to be, but if y'all have questions, I'm happy to stick around and answer them. Wow, Ben, that is impressive. I, everyone in the chat is just like um, really uh, impressed with this uh, really interconnected, um, robust internship program. So many students, I know. They, they tend to be the backbone of our, of our programs and our engagement. Um, so it looks like you're doing it well. And I'll just say before we move to the questions, you really put the social in social sustainability with your interns. Um, and I, I'm just really impressed with the foundation that you build when those interns come on um, and a lot of like trust building within the group so that people are comfortable with each other, can like share their, you know, thoughts, feelings, suggestions. It sounds like there's a lot of trust there and, and that's really important. And, and I'm really also, um, I, I, I appreciate that what you did really opened up it was a welcoming experience or your, or your office is very, seems to be very welcoming. And so, you know, I think like, a lot of people feel like they need to target all the various groups on campus to like invite people in. And it sounds like maybe in the beginning, there was a little bit of that of like targeting different majors and different uh, affiliate groups on campus. But once you, once your team is showing representation and people are feeling welcome and that they could feel comfortable working with other students that either they think have experiences like them, look like them, um, you know, all of that, it's really, it's really about, the welcoming aspect of it and, and the, you know, inviting, not, not necessarily inviting people, but letting people, you know, um, having people feel comfortable um, in the realm of sustainability. And it's, it's not an exclusive um, kind of, kind of team. So thank you for sharing all of that. Um, I think one of the first questions that came through, uh, again, kind of goes back to the, the size <laughs> of your internship program. So two questions that I'll kind of combine are what's the management structure with so few full-time staff um, 
and and are these paid interns? Um, you know, with so many of us having limited staff and limited budgets, how are you able to manage yeah. so many wonderful students that do amazing work for you? Oh, yeah, thank you for the questions. Um, so uh, I, yeah, I guess what I, I should say then is uh, we have a, between eight and 12 students every semester, usually about 10. And those are like um, new, typically now they're going to be new students each semester. I do allow people to return um, in the original, in like the early stages, we had students that would be like here for like two or three years sometimes, quite honestly. Um, but as we've kind of grown, and I really want to make sure that I have opportunities for as many people as possible. Like, I don't know if y'all are aware, a and is, it's way too big. We have like 80,000 people here. Or like we have like 60,000 plus students, 8,000 faculty pads, it's massive. So I really want to have opportunities. So what I've done is I've limited it to like a one year. You can be in the internship program for one year. Um, and then typically it's about a semester is what, you know, most people are spending is about a semester, but if students do really well, then I will invite them, you know, for, for a, a, another year. Um, now there is a way to stay longer. We have very limited financial resources. So I'm able to pay between two and three students. Um, so those, those positions to get those positions, you have to go through the internship program because we've already, you've already had to apply, you've, the whole application process, you know, like you have to apply, you have to fill out application questions, we interview you, you know, it's a whole process that they have to go through. So that lead, makes us feel really good. We've already vetted students, they've shown, you know, over a, a semester, a year, their, their value and what they can do. And then, you know, if we have positions available, we'll offer positions to people. And what I typically, like what I did recently is, um, we used to have like a team leader where it's like they would be like in charge, they would get paid and they would report to me. Um, but I, I recently decided that the management style is I, I actually just lead the students and then my paid student workers are actually doing like side projects. So I thought that was actually more useful for our office. So like one of them helps me with um, STARS, which is our big um, assessment tool. And then the other student um, helps me with organizing student groups on campus. But I manage my, the interns like myself directly. Um, but really like they kind of manage themselves in a way, you know, I really give them kind of like guidance and these are what I want you to do. These are your due dates. Here's examples, but I give them a lot of autonomy and freedom to kind of create. So I don't have to like sit in the room with them all the time. Thank you. We, we only unfortunately have time for about one more question um, and I'm going to combine them. Um, so, um, a lot of great stuff. Um, are there one or two programs that are, are really home runs? And, and I just will add to that um, programs that have significantly changed as the diversity of your internship and the experiences and the topics and the and uh, has has grown with with your internship. So are there any programs that that you think really kind of hit a home run and and were do you think they were um changed by the students that that you have now on on making up your team um i'm not in exactly sure what you mean by programs i think you probably mean like kind of like the outreach mediums that we're kind of creating okay yeah um i think it's made a world of difference um quite honestly like just in the variety of topics it it's so different what the students are interested in when you have a more diverse group of students you know um, for example, I mean, I just had one of my students, she was with us for a long time and she was just so creative. She had such an artistic mind and she was so creative. And, um, you know, one of the things that she did is we ate edible insects, um, you know, one day. Uh, she created uh, the game of life, but it was about like social sustainability. So she like, this is life, but this is more like what would actually happen to you based on different barriers that you might have, you know? So that's just one example, you know? And so like, those activities I mentioned for her were like workshops, um, but all, you know, we've had a lot of students. And I think the thing that's cool too, is like, you'll have students that they've just kind of learned about these topics and then they want to take on the challenge of presenting about it. So they're new, you know, they're not experts. So I always love to see that too. Um, but I guess for me, I just love to see growth. I, every one of my students is different. They all come from a different point where they're, they're at, you know, they all have different abilities. So I just really like, for me, I love to see them just grow. Like if you're nervous to speak at the end, if you're less nervous, that's a win. You don't have to be the best speaker in, in the program. Um, so I really just try to make sure and think about how to make sure that they get good experiences that are gonna be valuable to them in the long run. 
And, you know, when you do that, you get so much out of it. You know, they put in their effort. They enjoy being there. They do a great job. And I guess the other question is, yeah, the other students, I don't pay them. Um, I, I would love to. I would love to pay all of my students. Um, but we have we, our budget is small. It's tiny. Um, so they're all getting course credit. So when they're first in the program, they get course credit. It's a zero credit hour high impact learning course. They can get course credit through their colleges. Um, as well. So I just had to figure out how to use my resources effectively. Um, and the demand is there, you know, we keep having applicants. Um, and then we have those paid positions, you know, and, you know, so eventually I'd love to pay all of them. But I'll be honest, I don't see our budget increasing to that, that extent. Yeah, unfortunately, I think many of us can share in that, um, in uh, that experience. So unfortunately, uh, but hopefully, um, those that things will, will begin to change for, for many of our programs and we can um, provide the compensation that our students deserve for, for giving us their time and creativity. Well, thank you, Ben. Um, I hope hopefully we'll be able to share everyone's contact information, all of our presenters, because I do know there are some more questions in the chat um, for everyone, for you and for um, Alexis, and I'm sure for our, our next speaker. So we're gonna move on to, to um, keep on time here. Um, our next Community Connection case study focuses on local government and university collaboration to address both waste and community challenges that result from move out, which I'm sure we are all um, familiar with. So here today are Madeline Morgan and Brianna Duran. Madeline is a conservative program, conservation program coordinator for Austin Recovery Sorry, <laughs> start again. Conservation Program Coordinator for Austin Resource Recovery's Circular Economy Program. That's a long title. Um, she develops programs and initiatives to encourage residents to support local business, businesses, entrepreneurs, and nonprofits who are closing the loop in Austin. Maddie has over eight years of experience in the field and is on the steering committee for the State of Texas Alliance for Recycling's Reuse Council and her departmental green team. Maddie is a Waste 360 40 under 40 recipient and an alumna of the University of Texas at Austin and Texas State University. Joining Maddie is Brianna. She has been the Campus Environmental Center Coordinator in the University of Texas at Austin's Office of Sustainability for nearly five years. She manages student leadership and staff engagement programs. She also supports many other sustainability initiatives on campus from zero waste efforts to STARS reporting to move out ATX which we will hear about today. A Wisconsin native, Brianna received her master's degree in environmental and resource, environment and resources from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. So thank you, Maddie and Brianna, if you'd like to screen share. All right, is everybody able to see those slides? Yes, great. Um, so I'm Brianna Duran. Um, Brianna just did a great job introducing me. So I'll just say hi. And Maddie, if you want to introduce yourself before we kick off. Uh, Maddie, are you able to hear us? We're not able to hear you, Maddie. You're muted. Sorry, I just wanna make sure that we've got her sound on before we kick off. Maddie is calling from her phone, so we will <laughs> patiently wait for her to get the technology working. Are you able to hear us, Maddie? Maybe, there we go. Looks like she just unmuted. So she says she can hear us and she's entering. Let me admit her um, through that link. Maybe she'll be joined during in multiple sources. Oh, 
Are you with us, Maddie? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. <laughs> Weird. Yeah, I had called in through the audio number, but I guess it wasn't working and I could hear y'all, but all right, now we're good. Apologies for that. <laughs> all right, so I'll kick us off. Um, we're going to kind of swap, take turns on this presentation because Move Out ATX really is a partnership. So Thank you all for the opportunity uh, to chat with you today. Um, we're really excited to talk to you about the Move Out ATX program. Uh, this is a partnership between the city of Austin, um, which Maddie uh, works for, obviously, and the University of Texas at Austin's Office of Sustainability. So Move Out ATX is an off-campus move out donation and diversion program. We've, we've been running it in partnership for about three years. So I'm just going to start by kind of setting the stage. Um, so UT is a large, very urban campus. We have approximately 50,000 students, and over a third of them live in a single neighborhood just off campus called West Campus. So you can see um, in this map, the green outline is West Campus, uh, and it's directly adjacent to the university. So this is a one mile by half mile neighborhood. As I said, it's very dense and it gets denser every single year. There's an increasing number of high rises and condos being built. Um, students who come back, you know, 10 years later won't recognize it. It's also home to many of the Greek chapter houses, um, cooperative housing units, and there are still some remaining smaller apartment complexes and even a few single family homes. Um, though most of these are quickly being displaced by very tall high rises. So the city of Austin is a bit unique in that the city doesn't provide trash and recycling services to apartment complexes that are larger than four units. Um, instead, large multifamily properties, which is most of West Campus, have to contract with private waste and recycling haulers themselves. So because of this, the city does not have a lot of purview over the waste hauling that happens in West Campus. And because it's an off-campus neighborhood, the university also doesn't uh, have any purview over it. So I'm sure all of you that work on college campuses have this problem, especially those of you in urban areas, um, but there's an, always an annual student move out um, and it always causes lots of problems, right? So in Austin, the majority of leases end on July 31st, like almost all of them, and students usually aren't able to move into their new apartments until the second week of August. So there's an almost two week gap um, where students don't have anywhere to live. Um, so that gap, plus, of course, there's students moving out permanently after graduating. Um, this leads to a disposal of literal tons of reusable furniture, household goods, food, and other items. Again, I know this is a very common pro problem for most universities. So, of course, this is a waste issue, but it's also a public safety and a health issue. And, of course, for longtime residents of West Campus, there's few people still living in um, single family homes. It's an annual eyesore and a real um, issue for them. So I do want to note that UT does have an on-campus move out program. Um, it has been running since 2005 and it takes place in May when the dorms shut down for the year. Um, but this program only targets the residence halls. Uh, it's student managed. Um, I advise those students, it's under the Office of Sustainability. Um, and we aren't even quite meeting the need of all of our residence halls. So we're not able to expand beyond um, the on-campus um, diversion. So generally and unfortunately, the university considers West Campus outside its purview and not UT's responsibility, except in situations of student safety. As sustainability professionals and in our office, we know that the university has long had a significant and often negative impact on the community and so we think it's important to do something about that, to acknowledge it um, and try to do our part to reduce uh, the university and thus our students impact. Uh, after all, students live in West Campus because they're going to school here. Uh, if the university didn't exist, the problem wouldn't exist. So we really feel like participation in programs like Move Out ATX is an opportunity for the university to improve our community relations um, while also having the side benefit of addressing the environmental problem. It's also an opportunity for the university to teach students to be more respectful members of a community um, and to kind of create a culture of sustainability with them. For the city, Move Out ATX works towards the city's zero waste goals. Um, it reduces cold code violations and safety issues. 
Um, you know, historically, there's always a lot of longtime resident concerns and complaints, so trying to reduce those as well. So there's really um, benefits for everybody involved in this program. So I'm going to pass it over to Maddie now to kind of give you more of the details of the program itself. So the main pillar of our program is drop-off stations. Um, and I've got convenient drop-off stations because that's a really important piece of um, making the drop-off station successful. And what it looks like is we have reuse organizations that are responsible for collecting, well, helping set up and then collecting and transporting the material that's brought to the stations um, and making sure that it's removed by the end of the day. And um, we typically work with anywhere from five to eight different reuse organizations of different sizes, both for-profit and non-profit. We, we open the call up to any, any organization that wants to participate and benefit as long as they put in the, um, an equal effort as everyone else that is participating. Number of locations typically varies. Um, as Brianna said, we have done this for three years. Uh, we started in 2018 and we did have a hiatus in summer 2020 due to COVID. Um, and we've had a different number of stations every year. First year was three stations, then we went up to 10. And then this, this past summer, we did six stations. Um, but one important piece is that the locations are accessible by car. That's typically how um, folks brings, bring their items, especially if they have larger items. And then I think even more importantly is that it's accessible by box truck. Um, and so for that reason, um, parking garages um, inside of these large apartment complexes can be dif difficult. Um, and we try to just open aired um, space is what we, what we seek. Um, we, I think one of the things that I pride this program on is that we are able to accept most items. There are a couple of items we've had challenges with in the past, and we'll get to that later. One of those is mattresses, um, but we take anything from, you know, that you might be able to take to a, a typical thrift store, um, but we also take creative art or art and office supplies for our local creative reuse organization. We take unopened food. For um, this year, we actually were able to work with the University of Texas's um, food pantry, which is called the UT Outpost. And we also take opened um, and unopened cleaning supplies and toiletries, which um, we've had a different partner for each year. But again, those are, are materials that often get thrown away, but there is, there's a need for them in the community. And so it's really a one shop stop for students or any community member that wants to bring things. Um, and then we also make sure that each of the stations is staffed. Um, and so We've, it's kind of uh, changed as we iterate on the program, but, um, and as things in the world change, uh, the first two years of the program, we relied on volunteers, which we had pretty great success with um, recruiting volunteers, but they help staff the stations to help students and also to turn away materials that are unaccepted. So furniture that's in too poor of condition, or, you know, if mattresses are on our do not accepted list, we don't want those piling up at the station because if someone's driving by, then it looks like, oh, they accept it. Let me go drop it off there. And then that becomes just, you know, a customer, ser uh, customer service uh, obstacle to overcome, not to mention how to figure out, figuring out where to get take it to since our organizations wouldn't accept it. And then we haven't quite figured out the trend, but uh, we typically have our stations open for between five to six days um, and the between anywhere between five and eight hours um, on those days. Um, you would think, and I think we touch on this a little bit later, but it's really been difficult to de determine a trend of like these hours are the best and it, it's different every year. Um, and so we just kind of try to make our best guess uh, when we think students are going to be moving out. Um, and one thing that we don't touch too much on in this presentation, just for time's sake, but I have noted on here that the drop-off stations are part of the solution. And that's because 
we have been successful in finding other partnerships as we're building relationships with the multifamily properties, finding other ways beyond the drop-off stations to collect material and keep it out of the landfill. Um, things like uh, you know, having containers inside of apartment complexes or just mini pilots here and there. Um, but that again is, is more you know, specific to certain properties. And so what's it take to put on this event? Um, there is a program facilitator, um, which is me and I work very closely with Brianna um, in putting this program together um, from logistics of coordinating the reuse organizations, making sure you know, everyone is, is equally dispersed between our number of drop-off stations to the marketing and outreach. And of course the marketing and outreach is probably you know, the most important part, if we don't have students bringing stuff, then what good does it do? And um, it's also been one of our hardest things, which we'll talk about later. Um, but as far as budget goes, we, we spend about um, $5,000 on the marketing and outreach of the program um, to really try to get to the students. And, and we do try to work with multifamily property managers as much as possible, but there are sometimes barriers um, with that. And so that's why we have additional, you know, marketing and outreach banners that we hang up, um, paid advertisements, really just making sure that we can overcome some of the noise that students are faced with to make sure that they know there is a place where they can take um, their, you know, their stuff that still has life in it and when they're moving out. Um, so for a I guess at least for our department, I know in the previous presentation talking about um, budget restraints, um, but $5,000 to run a program, um, at least for, for us at the city is, is pretty good. Um, and of course that doesn't include staff time. And, in, and as I mentioned, as you know, helping oversee the program, it is a, a pretty significant portion of, of the time. Um, and, yeah, I think just with this area in general, it's a lot of building relationships. Property managers turn over a lot and you have to restart those relationships. Um, just a really quick look at kind of how we got where we are. Um, didn't just happen overnight as no program does, but we had about two years of collecting data with a couple of apartment complexes that had just reached out, were really interested in trying to do something just so that we could understand you know, what type of material is still being um, or is being thrown out that still has life in it. What do the streets actually look like capturing that? Just to bring back to you know, city staff that like, hey, this is a real problem and we need to do something and, and we can really move the needle if we're able to get this stuff out of the landfill towards our zero waste goal. So we had a lot of stakeholder meetings um, with reuse organizations with uh, zero waste experts and, and entities in our community, including staff from University of Texas, different city departments trying to figure out what had been done in this area, who was currently, you know, what departments were currently touching this West Campus area. Of course, the property managers, um, even residents and students, um, we all wanted to hear what their ideas were, what challenges they had. We put together a working group um, to create something. We didn't know what it would be, um, but it ended up taking the form of these drop-off stations. Um, as, as you can see, they're kind of fluctuated in terms of the size of, um, I guess if we're judging size by the number of stations that we've had each year. Um, and I will just point out too, with um, obviously the partnership we have with the UT Office of Sustainability is, is um, imperative in making this program successful. But there are a couple of city departments that we work closely with that have also been really um, helpful, including Austin Code, who they drive around on, on the days of the events, spreading the word for us, and then also giving out citations for illegal dumping. And then um, the Austin Transportation Department, which helps us with some of the right-of-way, securing right-of-way permits in front of our station so we can make sure it's safe and accessible for students to drop off material. I just wanted to get... Um, uh, a glance at kind of who it is that we work with. As I mentioned, we have both for-profit and nonprofit, large and small. Um, for those smaller specialty organizations, as we refer to them, 
we will have um, small boxes at all of the stations. Um, and then they're responsible at the end of the day for going and getting that material from all the stations. But, you know, um, Goodwill or Salvation Army will, would only be responsible for material from maybe one or two stations, but responsible for taking all of the furniture and the textiles and home goods and all of those things that they normally take. And as far as success stats um, over the three years, both with the donation stations and these um, additional initiatives that have just um, come to fruition through our efforts and, and working with this community, we've diverted over 166 tons of material, which, and these numbers are, are a little loose, but um, is, is over 2,000 cubic yards of material, um, which is, I think, a pretty astounding figure. Um, and it's over three hundred and sixty thousand um, dollars uh, or value of material recovered. That's not only, or that is going back into our community, um, which is, to me, and and the position I am in is really an, an important piece. Um, and so, um, you know, we haven't gotten there to these successful or to these stats. Um, I would say it hasn't been easy, <laughs> um, but there have been some wins along the way. And Brianna is gonna, gonna share a little bit about our, our top successes and challenges. Thanks, Maddie. So as Maddie mentioned, uh, Move Out ATX has had a number of successes. Um, in particular, every, every year we receive a lot of really good quality and a high quantity of home goods and kitchen wares. Um, these are pretty easy to collect and they're easy to, di to divert, so that's been great. We've also found that generally speaking, there seem to be fewer code violations um, in areas near the um, donation stations compared to other parts of West Campus. So this is great. That's one of the goals is to you know, reduce those kind of problem spots. And of course, the obvious one, there's definitely social value to the community. Everything that we collect is um, diverted and, you know, put back into the hands of people in need, which is, is really great. Um, the other big thing, and Maddie touched on some of this, but you know, because we're over there in West Campus, having these conversations with property managers, um, building relationships, kind of finding out about the, the issues that they're experiencing, the additional diversion opportunities have popped up. So I'm just gonna you know, give a couple examples. One of those is that a property manager um, that runs a property that does furnished rooms for students, um, learned because of the move out program, learned about a source of funding that the city provides, um, which he was able to use to pay for sanitization of their mattresses. So historically they were, you know, mattresses would last, you know, a year, maybe two years, and they'd have to throw them out. Um, because of this kind of initial funding, he was able to begin sanitizing mattresses. And now those mattresses last, you know, an, an extra few years. So a huge um, reduction in expense for him and of course, a big reduction in waste to landfill as well. And then another little example of, of kind of the positive impact of relationship building is another property manager um, through the move out program learned about um, the fact that they could recycle styrofoam and soft plastics through the city of Austin's recycling drop off center. So they just weren't aware of that program and they're now able to implement that as a standard practice in their building. So just some like little additional um, pluses that have come out of the relationship building. It's also been really great for partnership building um, in addition to relationship building. So for example, um, Maddie talked about some of the big reuse organizations as well as our specialty organizations. Through Move Out ATX, those folks were talking um, and they've begun partnering as well. So, you know, Goodwill, if they get art supplies and school supplies, you know, they're all over the place and they get lost. They don't really bring them value as an organization. Um, versus for our Austin Creative Reuse, that, that is like all they deal in. Um, so that partnership has developed so that they are receiving these types of materials from the bigger reuse organization. So just creating a space for those folks to talk in a collaborative environment has been really great. Um, another uh, great partnership is that reuse organizations have um, directly partnered with properties to host indoor collection bins. So Maddie mentioned those. And we found that in situations where they have done indoor collection bins, they collect a lot of stuff. Um, it's way more convenient for students. Uh, I mean, we really hope to see more of those kind of direct connections between property and reuse organization. So 
partnership building has been huge, a huge success of the program. Um, and then last, you know, all in all, the program isn't perfect. I'm about to tell you how it's not perfect. Um, but we really think it's important that both the city um, and the university continue working on this problem. Uh, we don't feel like we can walk away even with the challenges I'm about to share. So one of the big things that we, we struggled with this year um, was that our larger reuse organizations can be really particular about the quality of furniture they accept. Um, understandable, they have to try to resell it and some of them are more particular than others, but you won't be surprised to hear that most students buy inexpensive furniture, press board furniture, stuff like you get at Ikea. And some of our reuse organizations just won't accept those materials, even if they looked fine to us. So that's been a challenge is that, you know, we've, we're collecting this material and then our reuse org won't take it. Um, Maddie mentioned, mentioned mattresses. Uh, that's an ongoing challenge. There just is not an outlet full of mattress recycling in Austin. So we aren't able to collect those. Um, and of course, there's a lot of them are in great condition, maybe used for a year. So that's been a tough one to stomach some years, most years. Uh, another big challenge has been getting buy-in from property management companies. Um, that I would say is one of our biggest challenges. They would be by far our best way to promote the program. They have direct contact with every single resident in their uh, building. Um, but it seems that they're I think one issue is that they are so big in some cases that it's just like a drop in the bucket financially for them to just buy or rent out a big roll off dumpster. It's easy. They do it every year. They don't have to think about it. Um, so they just don't have a significant financial incentive to promote the donation drive and be active participants. Um, and kind of related to that, it just seems that in a lot of cases, there's not that culture of sustainability within the property management team. So if the leadership doesn't care, their boots on the ground staff don't care. Uh, and that's really been a challenge for us as well. And then unsurprisingly, for any of you who work at large universities, we have a lot of very thick, thick walled silos um, that our office has trouble kind of breaking through. So while our office has been really involved in this uh, program, we haven't had a lot of success getting broader support from other UT departments. In particular, we'd like to get student affairs more engaged. We were excited this year, as Maddie mentioned, that they, that they run our on-campus food pantry um, and the food pantry was a really active participant this year, which has been awesome. Um, but beyond that, we haven't had a lot of engagement. So it's been really difficult for us to get the word out to students. Um, you know, we can share it through our own social media channels and accounts, but um, it's hard to reach students beyond, you know, those that we regularly engage with. And then um, the last challenge I just want to mention, and this was a particularly a challenge this year, um, is that the reuse organizations were really facing their own challenges. So um, everybody's aware that COVID-19 has caused layoffs and staff shortages. They've had an excess of donated materials over the past year, which is sort of interesting. And so this has made it difficult for the organizations to participate in a way that's actually cost effective for them. So as just one example, many of the reuse organizations actually had to pay staff overtime um, in order to participate this year um, because they didn't have enough staff otherwise, which you know, obviously reduces the organization's return on investment from participating. So that's been um, a tough challenge this year in particular. i pass it back over to Maddie to talk about some of the lessons we've learned. Yeah. So just, just to kind of wrap us up, um, in addition to these successes and challenges, just some tips, I guess, that we want to pass along in case anyone else is interested in starting this kind of partnership. Um, geographical convenience, mentioned earlier the importance of convenience, convenience with the donation stations, but just trying to balance um, the number of stations with the amount of staffing that you have. Um, but Again, that's why the in-property bins are so successful. And if we didn't have to collect furniture, we would be pushing that all of the way, but furniture doesn't really fit in those bins. Um, timing, again, we haven't quite figured out what the best time is. We always think students are gonna be packing up earlier than they actually do, um, but it seems that the days just right closest to the move out date are really the best. And then of course the day out because students just wait, they don't wanna be going through their stuff early, they're busy um, and it, they just wait until the very last minute. Um, and so if you do have limited resources, our recommendation is kind of focusing on maybe one to two days before and the actual day of. 
breaking through the noise is hard. There's a lot going on, lots of advertisements coming to students from every direction. And how can we stand out and be different and make sure that they know about the program that is not only helping them figure out what to do with their stuff, um, but also helping the community. Um, and so we've done a lot of things through the, the past few years. It's hard to measure what's been successful, um, but you know, we've done things like over the, we did an over the street banner this year, um, having a banner on campus, advertising our website. Um, and we just hope that year over year being in West Campus at the same time, it spreads by word of mouth. And in fact, advertising on the day of and having volunteers or paid staff walking around um, the area and talking to people as they are moving out has actually proven to be one of our most successful um, ways to direct traffic towards the stations. Um, advertising to parents, also something to, to keep in mind. A lot of parents do come down to help their students move out. So um, we've gotten a lot of earned media over the years through interviews and radio, um, I guess TV interviews and radio interviews, hoping that, um, and parent newsletters, hoping that maybe parents see it and will encourage their, their students to bring the stuff to the stations as well. Staff stations, whether it's volunteers or staff, if you're working with reuse organizations in the way that we have in this program, it's really important to make sure that the material that we're spending the time collecting and that they're spending their resources you know, out, being out there with the program, um, that they're getting the most value for that. So if the stations are unattended, one, you may end up with material that's not accepted. You've got to figure out what to do with it. But, but two, this is a dumpster diver haven, if you will. And if there's an easier way to find stuff that doesn't include going in, in or around dumpsters, people will take that route. So we just try to have um, at least one person at the stations to make sure that doesn't happen just out of respect for the reuse organization's time um, and resources they're putting in. Um, if you have leverage to create policies in your community, you know, we're kind of strapped here in Austin, um, but pre-furnished units mean less waste. You don't have to deal with furniture, which is honestly the biggest headache, um, but it it's, seems to be the way the industry, the multi, the student housing is moving, um, but we're not all the way there yet. So if that's something you can advocate for in your community, you know, that'll help an extreme amount with the, the amount that's um, you have to deal with. Um, and then lastly, we've tried incentives. Um, honestly, it's not what we decided it wasn't worth the effort. Students had no idea we had created, you know, had this little sticker. It was good for all these coupons at all these local businesses for like till the end of July. So if they came early, it was good for two weeks for 10% off here and 10% off there or buy one, get one. But no student realized like no one came to the station to get the sticker like they just were coming because it was easy for them and because they wanted to help um, keep stuff out of the landfill so um, yeah I think I think that's that's it so thank you all for your time um, we really appreciate it looks like yeah well thank you so much to both of you um I was really impressed with, I was really glad that you reached out to, for your presentation. Um, I think, you know, oftentimes off campus move out gets ignored. Um, we're all just so busy with on campus and, and, and obviously the logistics are much more challenging off campus when you have limited um, control and authority. Um, I always like to say that you know, when I reach out to groups that are not affiliated necessarily with sustainability that, you know, that move out is it's an operational challenge with the sustainability benefit. And I think when it comes to off campus, it's a community relations challenge too, that the university has with the city and the community that they reside within. Um, and there's a sustainability benefit. So really kind of looking at, you know, what is the real problem here <laughs> that other people are willing to put the effort into to and, and, and maybe with with the city government um that kind of helps help sell the program and give you a budget too um we really only have time for like one question um so if um maybe during the next presentation um brianna and maddie if you wouldn't mind answering some of the questions in the chat but i think the biggest thing that 
again, drew me to this topic is that, you know, a lot of times our universities do not work with our local and city governments. And there's clearly huge benefits that, that you guys have shown. Um, so can you please offer some advice? Like how was this initi initiated? Was it from the city office or the sustainability office? Um, and just sort of initially like troubleshooting, like how two very complicated, probably decentralized and entities <laughs> like a city and a university, how do you make it work? So definitely was a city catalyst or catalyzed from the city side. Um, and I, since ever since I've been at um, or with, with the city, we've had a good relationship with um, the or at least the University of Texas's Office of Sustainability. And so from that angle, it was, it was easy to get connected um, and, you know, pitch this idea. I think we're still kind of trying to work on how we get the full university buy-in in support of this program. Um, but, you know, just even knowing one or two people at the city or at, at the university um, can open a lot more doorways. So for example, you know, I think we already I knew several people within different departments at UT, um, but if we hadn't and we just known um, Brianna, then she could have plugged us in with, you know, the, uh, you know, waste management staff at, at UT and housing and dining, um, you know, sustainability point of contact and some of the other um, areas that we have worked closely. I, I didn't mention this during the presentation, but we, we to keep our budget low, we, do our best to share resources, not to have to buy things. So we we um, rely on reaching out to other departments for materials like um, those signboard frames to borrow um, and, and various items. And so they've been really a critical partner in that as well. Um, but I think just like take the leap, find someone and find someone who is passionate um, and kind of willing to, to put a little time into it. That's my best recommendation, I guess. Yeah, it's all about personal connections, I think. And so as much as everybody hates the word networking, <laughs> I think that it is meaningful. So just getting out there and meeting the other sustainability folks in your community um, is really important. Thank you, I'm glad. Um, yeah, so connections, I mean, that's really the theme of, of the workshop today. Um, and hopefully, um, this will inspire some people to reach out to their cities uh, and their counties and local municipality governments. Um, and hopefully in the regional breakouts, maybe some folks can figure out a way to work together, to band together, to, to reach out to their to their uh, local government. So thank you both very much. And um, if you could you know, maybe try to answer in the chat, that would be awesome. But again, your contact information will be sent out um, after the workshop today. So, um, so our final community connection case study will focus on connecting with the dedicated people and groups in our communities working to address health and environmental justice. Sharing her experience in that space is Kayla Hickman. Kayla is the sustainability coordinator at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. She assists UMBC in achieving its carbon neutrality goal through engaging faculty, staff, and students in programs and events centered around sustainable living and empowerment. She has four year, over four years experience working on sustainability within higher education, especially as it pertains to waste reduction and community engagement. She believes that everyone has a role to play in building a more sustainable future. With that in mind, Kayla hopes to inspire others to unite in the common goal of creating a better future. And I am a, happy to be a colleague of Kayla's in Maryland and in Baltimore and participated in the event that she's gonna speak about today. And I'm very happy to have her here. So thank you, Kayla. Yeah, thank you so much for um, a wonderful introduction. Um, and yeah, speaking of connecting with local sustainability folks, um, Leon and I work together a lot on programming and especially last year with COVID, um, I think, our institutions found, I guess, like a positive from that. Everything being virtual was a lot easier to collaborate. Um, and so I'm gonna be talking a little bit about, um, you know, working with local 
environmental organizations, really grassroots organizations in your community. All of our communities have um, EJ communities, unfortunately, and um, most of them are working at the grassroots level, trying to build sustainable communities in our backyards. Um, I'm not going to be talking too much about the event. I'm going to be talking more so about how to do this or how to work with local orgs and kind of telling the story of what's going on in Baltimore. Um, and I did want to ground this root, like work sort of in the idea that um, every community has their own agency and it's really important for us as sustainability professionals to come in humbly and enter a space um, with humility and really just standing in solidarity to what the community needs and what solutions they're proposing. So um, I love this quote of, if you have come to help me, you're wasting your time, but if you've come because of your liberation is bound with mine, then let's work together. Um, so really fighting and uniting the, in a common way. Um, so just a little bit about the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, we're a medium sized research institution and um, I work in the Office of Sustainability and we're fairly new. So we started in August of 2019 and um, I started in January of 2020. So um, I'm very new to the Baltimore area and also with COVID. Um, kind of was feeling disconnected from Baltimore and it made working on sustainability in this area a little bit more difficult. Um, also about the Baltimore region, so there's Baltimore City and then there's Baltimore County, which is a very large county in Maryland. Within there, there's 12 universities. Um, we serve 120,000 students and 63,000 uh, faculty and staff, plus we have 300,000 campus visitors in a typical year when COVID is not um, inhibiting that. So we have a large impact in the region, whether it be positive or negative. Um, and there's an organization called Baltimore College Town Network, and we have a group called Because which is a coalition of sustainability um, officers at the institutions or represent representatives of that institution who are interested in environmental issues. So we kind of work a lot together and share ideas. And that was kind of my first introduction to folks from other institutions and really meeting Liana and also um, Patty Watson's on the call, Angela. So um, really just meeting those folks and hearing from them. And it's a really impactful group. So I started working in Baltimore and um, I became incredibly interested in collaborating with frontline community organizers because um, one, I feel that's really important to do in our work, but also too, of course, I think that, um, and this is mentioned previously in other uh, presentations, as sustainability professionals, we have kind of forgotten um, the social aspect and also talking about racism, talking about redlining um, and all of these issues and how they're interconnected with environmental issues. And Baltimore has a long history of racist policies and redlining and environmental injustice. Um, and so I'm gonna be kind of talking about uh, how we should enter those spaces and how we should build those relationships. Uh, I will also say like, I don't feel super comfortable talking about this because I feel like I did the bare minimum of just like doing a storytelling series. Um, I'm still continuing to do a lot of this work and it is very continuous and I'm not perfect. So I'm going to be talking about this from like a novice standpoint of kind of um, what myself and my colleagues have done and will continue to do throughout the years. Um, and first, when we're trying to engage with grassroots organizers, um, I think it's important to take responsibility 
Um, I think it's everybody's individual responsibility to identify what they don't know. And for me personally, um, as a white woman, I don't know how it feels to experience systematic racism. Um, so doing a lot of that work before approaching organizers, also learning about your own community. Um, so like I mentioned, there's a long history of redlining and racism in Baltimore, and I didn't know any of that history. And so really learning that and then also kind of discovering what solutions are being proposed is incredibly important before entering the space. Um, so throughout my research, I realized that um, one of the biggest issues going on right now in Baltimore is uh, related to the Bresco incinerator. So it's been in operation since the 80s and located in South Baltimore. The majority of the waste burned there, so it's about 700 thousand tons of waste, residential and commercial, comes from Baltimore City and the county. So our waste systems are very interlinked. Um, the city sent almost 380,000 tons in 2017 and the county 280,000 tons. So as a county where I'm located, we're importing waste into the city to be burned in other communities. Um, and like I mentioned, the I'm going to be talking about the Baltimore region. Sometimes we'll be talking about the city. Both of our entities, um, you know, produce a lot of waste. Baltimore County being the most, um, and there is a lack of infrastructure currently since we've had an incinerator since the '80s to really um, be able to handle that amount of waste. Because when you have an incinerator, there's no uh, incentive to build recycling infrastructure and composting infrastructure because that incinerator needs more waste to really fuel itself. So, you know, what's the issue and what are kind of the inequities going on? This is a map of all of the waste infrastructure located in Baltimore City. And as you can see, there's a hyper concentration here in the Brooklyn Curtis Bay area, Hawkins Point. Um, number five is where the incinerator is located near Cherry Hill. These are historically working class black neighborhoods. Um, and not only are there two incinerators, so Bresco and the Curtis Bay Medical Waste Services incinerator. There is also Quarantine Road Landfill. So when you incinerate waste, it creates a byproduct of toxic ash that is landfilled in Curtis Bay area. There's also a coal export um, facility there. There's a heavy, heavy, heavy concentration of highways um, and over a dozen brownfill toxic sites. Um, and this is just really reinforcing the racial and economic disparities, including life expectancy and also asthma rates in the area. Um, Baltimore is an incredibly segregated city and you have the white and wealthy living in different areas, accumulating a lot of wealth at the expense of the health of, um, you know, black neighborhoods. And it is, you know, really evident when you start looking at where these facilities are placed. And um, the Baybrook area is Brooklyn Curtis Bay right here in the red. And um, this is a map of life expectancy in Baltimore. So there is a 19 to 20 year life expectancy gap um, from the wealthiest area like Patterson Park and Roland to the Curtis Bay. And of course, there's a lot of social determinants when it comes to life expectancy, but also you can see in terms of um, air quality, how this impacts folks um, by looking at the hospitalization rates and asthma rates. So Baltimore has a asthma rate that's three times uh, Maryland average and Curtis Bay area has the highest asthma hospitalization rates out of anywhere in Maryland. Um, and a study found that Baltimore has one of the highest mortality rates in the US due to air pollution. And it's mostly concentrated in this one area. 
And so I'm doing all this research and kind of finding out some more information. And I came along an article written by uh, Nikki Fabricant, who is a faculty member at Towson about an organization called Free Your Voice. Um, so around 2011, there was actually a proposed, a proposed for another incinerator, which was two miles away from Ben Franklin High School. And it was gonna be the largest incinerator in the country. So burning about 4,000 tons of waste daily, mostly from out of state. So on top of those two incinerators, adding an additional incinerator in the same area. And um, this really catalyzed or organizing at the youth level. So Free Your Voice is an organization that still exists in Bren Ben Franklin High, High School. And then um, a Towson student, Destiny Watford, uh, organized protests with United Workers and um, actually halted the project, which was really awesome. This has led to other organizations popping up. So South Baltimore Community Land Trust is the main organization that Nikki now works with. And so I decided to kind of reach out to her and discuss how we as institutions can help um, and also hear more about what's going on at the community level since she had already had a built rapport and um, had been working for years with some of these organizers. Um, a couple of other organizations that I found out about was um, Baltimore Compost Collective, which is a uh, compost, a small composting organization that hires young folks from the Curtis Bay area to collect organic waste and compost it to be used at the Filbert Street Community Garden, where some people um, have vegetable plots, but there's also, you know, really cute chickens and cats on the farm. And then a new uh, part of South Baltimore Community Land Trust is Baltimore Broken Glass, where young artists actually collect glass that would have been thrown away and from vacant lots and make it into art and sell it on Etsy to help South Baltimore Community Land Trust with some of the work they're doing. And really this work is incredibly interdisciplinary because not only are they focusing on the environment and health, um, but also affordable housing and labor. So really having fair development if we get rid of the incinerator, look at all the jobs, good paying union jobs that we could create. Um, the Community Land Trust is heavily focused on building housing on the plots of lands that they've purchased and having community owned housing. Um, so really taking an interdisciplinary approach and a grassroots level approach. So I met with Nikki and I started meeting with some other folks and started to learn a little bit more about the, I would say, betrayal of um, inst large institutions, big green organizations, um, the city, and uh, broken promises to the community organizers, which I don't think is unique to Baltimore at all. Um, so in 2019, a lot of, I say big green organizations, I'm not going to name them, but <laughs> I'll just say, so um, they were trying to push forward the Green Energy Jobs Act at the Maryland state level, and they were successful in 2019. Um, previous to Annapolis opening up, they were working with community organizers, and one of the biggest uh, things is that incineration is not cost effective. And so the way that the incinerator is able to operate is by subsidies from the government because they're considered a tier one renewable energy. So they've had, um, I think they've gotten about like $10 million worth of subsidies from the Maryland state government for being renewable energy. Um, so there was supposed to be an amendment in the, Cre the Clean Energy Jobs Act that was going to remove incineration as a tier one renewable energy source, which would effectively close it down because it wouldn't be cost efficient. Um, and behind closed doors, essentially a politician said, I will not sign on to this if you do not get rid of that stipulation. I'm sure there was a lot of money that was paid by Bresco to make that happen. Um, and so without consulting the community, they decided to remove the amendment and pass the legislation as is. Um, also, 
Uh, we, in 2020, Baltimore City had a new mayor come in, um, Mayor Scott, who in his campaign had mentioned that he was not going to sign on to a new Bresco contract. So in 2020, the Bresco contract for the city and for the county were coming up for renewal. And um, when, you know, Mayor Scott got into office, he ended up re-signing and extending the contract to 2031. These are just a few examples. I will also say that our institutions are not um, free of hand, like not free of, I guess, breaking promises as well. Um, a lot of our institutions perpetuate this issue and a lot of our institutions also um, perpetuate the issue of gentrification and other things and not including the community in our decision-making. So, from an institutional standpoint, we also have really messed up in the past. And so it's important when you're entering into community spaces to work on repairing and establishing that trust through action. Um, and I think that is gonna be a multi, multi, multi-year process of build, rebuilding those relationships and really building trust. Um, Uh, also, it's important to elevate voices and elevate certain stories, and that's kind of where the event series uh, comes in. So, along with Nikki, she started connecting me with faculty members and staff members from Towson University, Goucher, and also UMBC because I was super new, so I didn't know who to reach out to faculty-wise. And um, she connected us with South Baltimore Community Land Trust. And we decided to do a virtual event series for the spring 2021 year, which is called Combating Toxic Injustices, Grassroots Solutions for Healthy Communities, which is a mouthful. Um, and it was a three part storytelling series. So we had, um, we we're supposed to have three events. I'll go into what happened with the third event um, each month to kind of tell a story and set the stage. And so, because it's a very complicated and convoluted issue that has a lot of different things intersecting it. So we started out with talking about community health impacts. We also then we went on to talk about current waste infrastructure and zero waste solutions and how we can kind of move Baltimore County and Baltimore City to a more zero waste um, system so that we can starve the incinerator. And then the last event was supposed to be community-based solutions at the grassroots level. So really hearing from um, South Baltimore Community Land Trust, the Black Yield Institute, and other organizers on what they're currently doing and what they envision once the incinerator is gone. Um, we had about 120 attendees. And then we also posted the events on YouTube and had like 70 views. Um, and you know, I kind of talked a little bit about this before, but one of the goals of this series was spreading awareness. So we felt that our students in our community were unaware of the issue and also unaware of how race intersects with sustainability. We also wanted to elevate voices and create a sense of community agency, deeply focusing in on solutions that are proposed by the community. And then finally building a coalition to build transformational change. So moving beyond these event series, building a coalition between organizers and the institutions to try and actually um, do something and you know, put words into action. So like I mentioned, um, we didn't have our last event because um, South Baltimore Community Land Trust actually came to us and we were planning on having our last event on Earth Day. And they had kind of come to us and said, hey, would you mind if we, you know, ran an event, we wanna do, Balt you know, we wanna run an event called Baltimore's first annual zero waste day with the intent of doing it year by year. Um, and we also wanna propose some new, you know, initiatives because they were super focused on closing down the incinerator and they still are, but with the signing of, uh, the Bresco contract, they sort of had to pivot. And so they're like, can you push your community and attendees who have attended the events who were really set up to enter this zero waste day with a lot of knowledge? 
um, to go to our zero waste day and support us. And so I was like, yeah, of course, that's like what this is all about. It's all about hearing from the community. It's all about what you all want. I wouldn't want to do an event like the same day you're doing your event. That doesn't make any sense. So we decided to push all of our attendees towards this event, which was really successful. There was like about 200 participants um, and just really awesome dynamic event. And then lastly, um, collaboration. So like I mentioned, moving beyond one-off events and identifying points of intervention. Um, unfortunately, a lot of issues like this for some reason are politicized because America has a, you know, a really interesting way of making everything political in order to, you know, stifle. Um, and, you know, this is a human health issue. This is an issue of race. This is a people issue. There are people like literally dying because of toxic pollution. So um, unfortunately, as state institutions and as a state employee, sometimes within my position, I don't have complete power to quote unquote say certain things. But what I can do is I can listen to the community and try to push these initiatives on my campus. So um, South Baltimore Community Land Trust came to me, came to um, all the other institutions within because and they were interested in talking to us about a local composting facility located in South Baltimore that would, um, you know, practice fair labor practices and really bring jobs to a community who's been disenfranchised by the incinerator. And this was also with the intention of starving the incinerator because 30% of our institutional waste is organic and can be composted. A lot of our institutions were already composting, but we actually send it 40 miles towards DC because we live in a composting desert. Um, and so, you know, we're talking to each other and we're like, well, it is within our best interest to have a local facility. And we would so much rather send it locally and support you all than sending it 40 miles down the road. So um, we've been kind of working together to talk to the Baltimore City Department of Public Works to let them know that as institutions, we are going to continue composting. A big concern is that there's not gonna be customers for this new composting facility. So mentioning that, you know, our, our preference is to send it to Baltimore. So if you build a facility, we'll use it. Um, so that's sort of kind of higher level stuff that we're trying to work on together. And we could talk about the success and failure of that. Uh, it's really difficult sometimes to get in contact with the county just to set up a simple meeting. Um, also heavy integration into the curriculum. So reaching out to faculty and professors who I think would um, their classes align with this topic and connecting them, especially with Nikki, because she created an inter-campus zero waste coalition with faculty. So really connecting them to Nikki and seeing how we can get our students involved with organizing um, and building a grassroots movement on our campus. And so right now I'm working with um, UMBC Sunrise Movement and also our Greenpeace folks and kind of seeing how we can start a campaign on our campus to reduce organic waste and also support South Baltimore Community Land Trust in a more intentional way. Um, I'm gonna end my uh, presentation there. Like I mentioned in the beginning, um, this work has really just begun. It started last year and um, it's still actively continuing. Um, I know, we'll send emails out after this. And so I'll give you links to some of the organizations that I had mentioned so that you can learn a little bit more. There's donation links, you could buy a glass, you know, art piece, but also you can just learn more and connect. And if you are around locally, you can also volunteer. So um, just wanted to put that out there and I will, I will stop there. Thank you, Kayla. Um, I will just say, and you may not know this, Kayla, but I had to turn down an invitation to a meeting that's happening that just happened maybe an hour or two ago with Baltimore Community South, South Baltimore Community Land Trust, a uh, professor of public health that uh, works with them in epidemiology and environmental health from Hopkins. 
And our hour, the, the compost hauler that most of the institutions in Baltimore use, and a company that's looking to, in, to build a compost facility, potentially in six months, um, wow. on the property that Baltimore, South Baltimore Community Land Trust um, owns. So it is coming together and it's super exciting. Um, I think like every piece of the presentations today, whether it be the you know reduction of plastic waste, so that we can move towards you know a more just and healthy uh, communities, um, working with diverse groups on our campuses, and working with our government and our local our local governments and our and our local nonprofits um, to really move this movement forward is is really come full circle. So um, I just wanted to share that with everybody that we are. We're making some progress here in Baltimore. Um, we get some bad rap, but um, but we're doing good things. Um, so I'll just um, open it up for one question. We probably have time for one question for Kayla. Um, um, then we need to move on so we can do a wrap up. And um, so if anybody wants to un unmute and um, ask any questions for Kayla or type anything in the chat. I'm going to unmute myself here, Kevin Bram at GMU. Kayla, I miss you. Yay! Kayla, oh Kayla, my God. Yeah. This is, guys, this is crazy. This is like legitimately crazy right now. I didn't even recognize you when you un. Okay, sorry. Because <laughs> I worked with Kevin when I was a student starting a compost program there and stuff. <laughs> How are you? We're still at it, we're still working on it. Well, it's so nice seeing you. Are you coming to the community, like the regional meetup? Don't worry, we won't take up this. I'll be talking <laughs> to you later. I'll be in touch with you. Okay, cool. Awesome. Sorry about that, y'all. And too, I love um, Rob's comment about uh, you know waste reduction efforts are making incinerators not justifiable from a business perspective. And that's that's totally true. Like, um, you know, with the county contract, so um, Baltimore County actually was being sued by the incinerator because they weren't, they were trying to pull away. And so they weren't sending enough waste because when you sign a contract for an incinerator, usually you have to send a minimum amount of waste over. Um, and the county was not abiding to that minimum waste standard and was being sued and kind of got bullied into a new contract so that they wouldn't get sued. <laughs> um, and so the new contract states we have to send a minimum of 250,000 tons of waste to the incinerator or we will get fined. Um, so it's it's um, incinerators all over. You know, we've heard from other folks too with the talks and everything, but yeah, not not good. <laughs> well, thank you again, Kayla. Um, I am excited to uh, to join a, the regional breakout with you and and some others on the call in the um, mid Atlantic. Um, I'm going to turn it over before I turn it over to Franklin, um, who's going to do our wrap up. I just want to thank all of our presenters and participants for an incredibly engaging and stimulating conversation. We really can build better connections with our communities and our campus, um, both beyond on our campuses and beyond. Um, you know, I, I think we started out hearing some pretty dismal things from um, Alexis, which, you know, she's telling us the truth, which we know we need to hear it. Um, but I'm excited to end on really some positive um, collaborations um, as, as a group and, and some, some hope for us all. Um, I also do want to just quickly thank um, all the folks who helped make this workshop possible. Um, so uh, thank you to Rob Johnson, Eric Calverson, Jen Maxwell, Franklin Cantor, Corey Berman, Leah Separley, all the members of the Marketing and Programs Committee, and of course, our wonderful speakers. So I thank you all, and I'm gonna hand it off to Franklin to wrap us up. Thanks, Leanna, and thanks everybody. Leanna, it's totally fair to say that the Marketing and Programs Committee did a ton of work to make this possible, and your leadership um, is an incredible part of that. So thank you, and thanks to everybody 
I, I am not deserving of thanks. I am showing up at the end to say a couple of things about the Kirk board. So uh, really thank you to, to everybody involved and, and to all the presenters. Um, I have like a binder full of things I've scribbled down today and, and I um, am just, my, my brain is exploding with all the things that I wanna try to do here as a result of what I've learned today. Um, who am I? I'm, I'm Franklin, I'm the secretary of the board here for Kirk. Um, you can find me just outside of Philadelphia at Haverford College, where I serve as the assistant chief of staff. We don't have full-time sustainability staff, uh, so I get to do a good number of sustainability policy work and project work with a particular focus on the waste stream. Because I'm just outside of Philadelphia, I'm actually a short distance from the terminus of that ethane gas pipeline you saw across Pennsylvania in Alexis's presentation. So when you when you think about fracking, you'll know that it's all ending up just in my backyard, which is exciting and terrible. Okay, so on, on to more Kirk business. Um, we got a, a lot going on and uh, you may be wondering what the 12 of us actually are doing at any point during the year other than organizing wonderful events like this. And so I just wanna give you a, a, little, a little peek into that. Um, coming up soon is our member survey, a chance to hear from our members about what they'd like to see from Kirk, give us some feedback about how we're doing as an organization. We use the tool to gather that feedback regularly. And this year in particular, we're gonna be focusing on measuring and setting a baseline of the diversity of our membership, intentionally working towards expanding access and inclusivity of representation. So um, we got a lot of good questions. It will not take more than a few minutes, um, but uh, please keep an eye out for that. And it's gonna really inform our work as we plan for the coming year. And we will provide a report on the results at the members meeting. The, one of the reasons for that particular focus is um, our own work with a self-assessment. We've done this with 122 Consulting. This, has been, this work has been led by our board leadership and our Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee, shorthand the JEDI Committee, um, and, which just ties in so nicely with everything that's happened earlier today and, our, and the wonderful presentation. Um, some of the biggest strengths we learned from this self-assessment included the development of the committee itself and low barriers to access for most of our materials and programs. Um, there are also a lot of big opportunities for us, incorporating those values across our content and programs, formalizing a number of policies and procedures, even for a small organization like Kirk, and, and trying um, to build a more culturally relevant communication strategy that's just more inclusive across the board. We're looking forward to next steps. We'll have a lot more for you, and, and you're going to hear more about it, especially at the members meeting. But we got a plan for that members meeting, and a lot of that work will happen at the upcoming board retreat. The this is this is a thing I'm sharing, but you're actually not invited because it's just a small a small group of us on the board that are going to come together for an intensive meeting, uh, an opportunity to think strategically about our mission and programs, to delve deep, and to do some intentional planning, particularly around our staffing support, which Eric Halverson so capably provides. Um, okay, this is like a marathon. The members meeting is um, is going to be in January. It's a great time for us to reflect, to share, and to look forward. What have we accomplished? What have you all accomplished? What has it meant to be engaged in this work through almost two years in a COVID-impacted environment? Um, everybody is welcome. I I'm not sure that everybody realizes whether they're a member or not, but we have a, we are, there is no, there is, um, What's the right term for it? There's no, no bar. Everyone can be a member. We want everybody present at the members meeting. Uh, we'll go over everything I've talked about and more. Look out for an agenda and more information in December after we have a chance to plan at the board retreat. Okay, last thing, uh, next webinar. Um, if, you, if you have any room in your, in your brain and your binder for more content, in just about three weeks, we've got the next iteration in our webinar series, integrating reduction and reuse into messaging. Um, on Thursday, October 21st. You'll get e information about it via email, but we're still recruiting case studies to participate. If you um, would like to have an opportunity to share, I'm gonna throw a link to our webinar proposal form in the chat. Um, we love to, oh, that's just to Leanna. So crushing it there. All right, everybody. Um, okay, so there's a link to a Google form. It would just be great if you feel like you've had some experience integrating a reduction and in reuse into messaging, we would welcome that and would love to be able to engage in conversation with everyone. 
Okay. We've caught up. We're almost at the point where we can adjourn and move to regional breakouts, but just wanted to pause to thank you all so much for participating all day or all afternoon, depending on which time zone you're in, and to invite any possible questions about Kirk itself, about our board, about anything on our agenda. I know everybody um, could probably use a quick bio break, so those questions can always be directed to any of us on, on the board uh, through the chat or via email. Um, or after the fact, it's, it's uh, whatever works best. We're always here and in, excited to engage about the organization and the work that we all have in front of us. I'm gonna see that nobody's jumping in, which means it's the perfect time to move to regional breakouts, an opportunity for folks to come into conversation with those a little bit physically closer to them. Eric has graciously dropped the links to the different regional breakouts in the chat. You'll see one for New England, one for the Mid-Atlantic, one for the Southeast, and one for the Midwest, hosted by different board members. Um, let's take, um, I think, let's take five to 10 minutes and try to be in the regional breakouts by 3.05 Eastern time at the latest, and we'll go from there. Thank you everybody for, for joining us today and to our presenters again, we, we can't thank you enough for sharing so generously today. Thank you all so much. We'll see you in the breakouts. And Rob, are we keeping open this channel for anyone who doesn't have a region um, to go to? Oh, uh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, we can do that. Awesome. Thanks for clarifying, Eric and Rob. Yeah, um, we did not have a sort of a critical mass for other areas of the country, but of course, those are also very important. Um, I'll stay here and um, am thrilled to engage with anybody who doesn't fit into one of those uh, pre predetermined regions. <laughs>